Bread Overhead by Fritz Lieber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Corey Samuel. As a blisteringly hot, but guaranteed weather controlled future summer day dawned on the Mississippi Valley, the walking mills of puffy products, spike to loaf in one operation, began to tread delicately on their centipede legs across the wheat fields of Kansas. The walking mills resembled fat metal serpents, rather larger than those Chinese paper dragons animated by files of men in procession. Sensory robot devices in their noses informed them that the waiting wheat had reached ripe perfection. As they advanced, their heads swung lazily from side to side, very much like snakes, gobbling the yellow grain. In their throats it was threshed, the chaff bundled and burped aside for pickup by the crawl trucks of a chemical corporation, the kernels quick-dried and blown along into the mighty chests of the machines. There the tireless mills ground the kernels to flour, which was instantly sifted, the bran being packaged and dropped like the chaff for pickup. A cluster of tanks, which gave the metal serpents a decidedly humpbacked appearance, added water, shortening, salt, and some other ingredients, some named and some not. The dough was at the same time infused with gas from a tank conspicuously labelled carbon dioxide. No yeast creatures in your bread. Thus instantly risen, the dough was clipped into loaves and shot into radionic ovens, forming the midsections of the metal serpents. There the bread was baked in a matter of seconds, a fierce heat front browning the crusts, and the piping hot loaves sealed in transparent plastic, bearing the proud puffy loaf emblem, two cherubs circling a floating loaf, and ejected onto the delivery platform at each serpent's rear end, where a cluster of pickup machines, like hungry piglets, snatched at the loaves with hygienic claws. A few loaves would be hurried off for the day's consumption, the majority stored for winter in strategically located mammoth deep freezes. But now, behold a wonder! As loaves began to appear on the delivery platform of the first walking mill to get into action, they did not linger on the conveyor belt, but rose gently into the air and slowly travelled off downwind across the hot, rippling fields. The robot claws of the pickup machines clutched in vain, and not noticing the difference, proceeded carefully to stack emptiness, tier by tier. One errant loaf, rising more sluggishly than its fellows, was snagged by a thrusting claw. The machine paused, clumsily wiped off the injured loaf, set it aside, where it bobbed on one corner, unable to take off again, and went back to the work of storing nothingness. A flock of crows rose from the trees of a nearby shelter belt, as the flight of loaves approached. The crows swooped to investigate, and then suddenly scattered, screeching in panic. The helicopter of a hangoverish Sunday traveller, bound for Wichita, shied very similarly from the brown flyers, and did not return for a second look. A black-haired housewife spied them over her back fence, crossed herself, and grabbed her walkie-talkie from the laundry basket. Seconds later, the yawning correspondent of a regional newspaper was jotting down the lead of a humorous news story which, recalling the old flying saucer scares, stated that now, apparently, bread was to be included in the mad aerial tea party. The congregation of an open-walled country church, standing up to recite the most familiar of Christian prayers, had just reached the petition for daily sustenance, when a subflight of the loaves, either forced down by a vagrant wind, or lacking the natural buoyancy of the rest, came coasting silently as the sunbeams between the graceful pillars at the altar end of the building. Meanwhile, the main flight, now augmented by other bread flocks from scores and hundreds of walking mills that had started work a little later, mounted slowly and majestically into the cirrus-flecked upper air, where a steady wind was blowing strongly toward the east. A 
about one thousand miles further on in that direction, where a cluster of stratosphere-tickling towers marked the location of the metropolis of New New York, a tender scene was being enacted in the pressurized penthouse managerial suite of Puffy Products. Megera Winterly, secretary-in-chief to the managerial board, and referred to by her underlings as the Blonde Icicle, was dealing with the advances of Roger, racehorse, Snedden, assistant secretary to the board, and often indistinguishable from any passing office boy. "'Why don't you jump out the window, Roger, remembering to shut the airlock after you?' the Golden Flacier said in tones not unkind. "'When are your high-strung thoroughbred nerves going to accept the fact that I would never consider marriage with a business inferior? You have about as much chance as a starving Ukrainian kulak now that Moscow's clapped on the interdict. Roger's voice was calm, although his eyes were feverishly bright, as he replied, A lot of things are going to be different round here, Meg, as soon as the board is forced to admit that only my quick thinking made it possible to bring the name of Puffyloaf in front of the whole world. Puffyloaf could do with a little of that, the business girl observed judiciously. The way sales have been plummeting, it won't be long before the government deeds our desks to the managers of fairy bread and asks us to take the big jump. But just where does your quick thinking come into this, Mr. Snedden? You can't be referring to the helium. That was Rose Thinker's brainwave. She studied him suspiciously. You've birthed another promotional bumble, Roger. I can see it in your eyes. I only hope it's not as big a one as when you put the Martian ambassador on 3D, and he thanked you profusely for the gross of puffy loaves, assuring you that he'd never slept on a softer mattress in all his life on two planets. Listen to me, Meg. Today, yes, today, you're going to see the board eating out of my hand. Ha! I guarantee you won't have any fingers left. You're bold enough now, but when Mr. Grice and those two big machines come through that door— Now wait a minute, Meg. Hush! They're coming now! Roger leaped three feet in the air, but managed to land without a sound, and edged toward his stool. Through the dilating iris of the door strode Phineas T. Grice, flanked by Rose Thinker and Tin Philosopher. The man approached the conference table in the centre of the room, with measured pace and gravely expressionless face. The rose-tinted machine on his left did a couple of impulsive pirouettes on the way, and twittered a greeting to Meg and Roger. The other machine quietly took the third of the high seats, and lifted a claw at Meg, who now occupied a stool twice the height of Roger's. Miss Winterly, please, our theme. The blonde icicle's face thawed into a little girl's smile, as she chanted bubblingly, Made up of tiny wheaten motes, and reinforced with sturdy oats, it rises through the air and floats, the bread on which all terror dotes. Thank you, Miss Winterly, said Tin Philosopher. Though a purely figurative statement, that bit about rising through the air always gets me here. He wrapped his midsection, which gave off a high musical clang. Ladies, he inclined his photo cells toward Rose Thinker and Meg, and gentlemen, this is a historic occasion in Old Puffy's long history, the inauguration of the helium-filled loaf, so light it almost floats away, in which that inert and heaven-aspiring gas replaces old-fashioned carbon dioxide. Later there will be kudos for Rose Thinker, whose bright relays genius sparked the idea, and also for Roger Snedden, who took care of the details. By the by, racehorse, that was a brilliant bit of work getting the helium out of the government. They've been pretty stuffy lately about their monopoly. But first I want to throw wide the casement in your minds that opens on the long view of things. Rose Thinker spun twice on her chair, and opened her photocells wide. Tin Philosopher coughed to limber up the diaphragm of his speaker, and continued. Ever since the first cave wife boasted to her next-den neighbour about the superior paleness and fluffiness of her tortillas, mankind has sought lighter, whiter bread. Indeed, thinkers wiser than myself have equated the whole upward course of culture with this poignant quest. Yeast was a wonderful discovery for its primitive day. Sifting the bran and wheat germ from the flour was an even more important advance, 
early bleaching and preserving chemicals played their humble parts. For a while, barbarous faddists, blind to the deeply spiritual nature of bread, which is recognized by all great religions, held back our march toward perfection, with their hair-splitting insistence on the vitamin content of the wheat germ. But their case collapsed when tasteless, colorless substitutes were triumphantly synthesized and introduced into the loaf, which for flawless purity, unequalled airiness, and sheer intangible goodness was rapidly becoming mankind's supreme gustatory experience. "'I wonder what the stuff tastes like,' Rose Thinker said, out of a clear sky. "'I wonder what taste tastes like,' Tin Philosopher echoed dreamily. Recovering himself, he continued, "'Then, early in the twenty-first century, came the epochal researches of Everett Whitehead, Puffy Loaf Chemist, culminating in his paper, The Structural Bubble in Cereal Masses, and making possible the baking of airtight bread twenty times stronger, for its weight, than steel, and of a lightness that would have been incredible even to the advanced chemist bakers of the twentieth century, a lightness so great that, besides forming the backbone of our own promotion, it has forever since been capitalized on by our conscienceless competitors of fairy bread, with their enduring slogan, it makes ghost toast. That's a beaut, all right, that ectodoe blurb, Rose Thinker admitted, bugging her photocells sadly. Wait a sec, how about, there'll be bread, overhead, when you're dead, it is said. Phineas T. Grice wrinkled his nostrils at the pink machine, as if he smelled her insulation smouldering. He said mildly, a somewhat unhappy jingle, Rose, referring as it does to the end of the customer as consumer. Moreover, we shouldn't overplay the figurative rises through the air angle. What inspired you?" She shrugged. I don't know. Oh, yes, I do. I was remembering one of the workers' songs we machines used to chant during the big strike. Work and pray, live on hay, you'll get pie in the sky when you die. It's a lie. I don't know why we chanted it she added. We didn't want pie, or hay for that matter, and machines don't pray, except Tibetan prayer wheels." Phineas T. Grice shook his head. Labour relations are another topic we should stay far away from. However, dear Rose, I'm glad you keep trying to outjingle those dirty crooks at fairy bread. He scowled, turning back his attention to Tin Philosopher. I get whopping mad, old machine, whenever I hear that other slogan of theirs the discriminatory one, untouched by robot claws, just because they employ a few filthy androids in their factories. Tin Philosopher lifted one of his own sets of bright talons. Thanks, P.T. But to continue my historical resume, the next great advance in the baking art was the substitution of purified carbon dioxide, recovered from coal smoke, for the gas generated by yeast organisms indwelling in the dough and later killed by the heat of baking, their corpses remaining in situ. But even purified carbon dioxide is itself a rather repugnant gas, a product of metabolism, whether fast or slow, and forever associated with those life processes which are obnoxious to the fastidious. Here the machine shuddered with delicate clinkings. Therefore, we of Puffyloaf are taking today what may be the ultimate step toward purity. We are aerating our loaves with the noble gas helium, an element which remains virginal in the face of all chemical temptations, and whose slim molecules are eleven times lighter than a beast carbon dioxide. Yes, noble, uncontaminable helium, which, if it be a kind of ash, is yet the ash only of radioactive burning accomplished or initiated entirely on the sun, a safe ninety-three million miles from this planet. Let's have a cheer for the helium loaf." Without changing expression, Phineas T. Grice rapped the table thrice in solemn applause, while the others bowed their heads. "'Thanks, T.P.,' P.T. then said. "'And now for the moment of truth. Miss Winterly, how is the helium loaf selling?' The business girl clapped on a pair of earphones and whispered into a lapel mic. Her gaze grew abstracted, 
as she mentally translated flurries of brief squawks into coherent messages. Suddenly, a single vertical furrow creased her matchlessly smooth brow. "'It isn't, Mr. Grice,' she gasped in horror. "'Fairy Bread is out selling puffy loaves by an infinity factor. So far this morning there has not been one single delivery of puffy loaves to any sales spot. Complaints about non-delivery are pouring in from both walking stores and sessile shops. Mr. Snedden, Grice barked, what bug in the new helium process might account for this delay? Roger was on his feet, looking bewildered. I can't imagine, sir, unless, just possibly, there's been some unforeseeable difficulty involving the new metal foil wrappers. Metal foil wrappers? Were you responsible for those? Yes, sir. Last-minute recalculations showed that the extra lightness of the new loaf might be great enough to cause drift during stackage. Drafts in stores might topple sales pyramids. Metal foil wrappers, by their added weight, took care of the difficulty. And you ordered them without consulting the board? Yes, sir. There was hardly time, and— Why, you fool! I noticed that order for metal foil wrappers, assumed it was some subsecretary's mistake, and cancelled it last night. Roger Snedden turned pale. "'You cancelled it?' he quavered. "'And told them to go back to the lighter plastic wrappers?' "'Of course. Just what is behind all this, Mr. Snedden? What recalculations were you trusting, when our physicists had demonstrated months ago that the helium loaf was safely stackable in light airs and gentle breezes, winds up to Beaufort's scale three? Why should a change from heavier to lighter wrappers result in complete non-delivery. Roger Snedden's paleness became tinged with an interesting green. He cleared his throat and made strange gulping noises. Tin philosopher's photocells focused on him calmly, rose thinkers with unfeigned excitement. P. T. Grice's frown grew blacker by the moment, while Megera Winterly's Venus mask showed an odd dawning of dismay and awe. She was getting new squawks in her earphones. Er, uh, ah, uh, er, uh, Roger said in winning tones. Well, you see, the fact is that I— Hold it, Meg interrupted crisply. Triple urgent from Public Relations, Safety Division. Tulsa Topeka Aero Express makes emergency landing after being buffeted in encounter with vast flight of objects, first described as brown birds, although no failures reported in Airways electronic anti-bird fences. After grounding safely near Emporia, no fatalities, pilot's windshield found thinly plastered with soft white and brown material. Emblems on plastic wrappers embedded in material identify it incontrovertibly as an undetermined number of puffy loaves cruising at 3,000 feet. Eyes and photo cells turned inquisitorially upon Roger Snedden. He went from green to puffy loaf white, and blurted, All right, I did it, but it was the only way out. Yesterday morning, due to the Ukrainian crisis, the government stopped sales and deliveries of all strategic stockpiled materials, including helium gas. Puffy's new program of advertising and promotion, based on the lighter loaf, was already rolling. There was only one thing to do there being only one other gas comparable in lightness to helium. I diverted the necessary quantity of hydrogen gas from the hydrogenated oil section of our magna margarine division, and substituted it for the helium. You substituted hydrogen for the helium, Phineas T. Grice faltered in low, mechanical tones, taking four steps backward. Hydrogen is twice as light as helium. Tin philosopher remarked judiciously. And many times cheaper, did you know that? Roger countered feebly. Yes, I substituted hydrogen. The metal foil wrapping would have added just enough weight to counteract the greater buoyancy of the hydrogen loaf, but so when this morning's loaves began to arrive on the delivery platforms of the walking mills, Tin philosopher left the remark unfinished. Exactly. Roger agreed dismally. "'Let me ask you, Mr. Snedden,' 
Rice interjected, still in low tones. If you expected people to jump to the kitchen ceiling for their puffy bread after taking off the metal wrapper, or reach for the sky if they happened to unwrap the stuff outdoors. Mr. Grice, Roger said reproachfully, you have often assured me that what people do with puffy bread after they buy it is no concern of ours. I seem to recall, Rose Thinker chirped, somewhat unkindly, that dictum was created to answer inquiries after Roger put the famous Sculptures in Miniature artist on 3D, and he testified that he always moulded his first attempts from puffy bread, one jumbo loaf squeezing down to approximately the size of a peanut. Her photo cells dimmed and brightened. Oh boy! Hydrogen! The loaf's unwrapped. After a while, in spite of the crust seal, a little oxygen diffuses in. An explosive mixture. Housewife in curlers and kimono pops a couple of slices in the toaster. Boom! The three human beings in the room winced. Tin Philosopher kicked her under the table, while observing, So you see, Roger, that the non-delivery of the hydrogen loaf carries some consolations. And I must confess that one aspect of the affair gives me great satisfaction, not as a board member, but as a private machine. You have at last made a reality of the rises through the air part of Puffy Bread's theme. They can't ever take that away from you. By now half the inhabitants of the Great Plains must have observed our flying loaves rising high." Phineas T. Grice shot a frightened look at the west windows, and found his full voice. "'Stop the mills!' he roared at Meg Winterly, who nodded and whispered urgently into her mic. "'A sensible suggestion,' Tin Philosopher said. But it comes a trifle late in the day. If the mills are still walking and grinding, Approximately seven billion puffy loaves are at this moment cruising eastward over Middle America. Remember that a six-month supply for deep freeze is involved, and that the current consumption of bread, due to its matchless airiness, is eight and one-half loaves per person per day. Phineas T. Grice carefully inserted both hands into his scanty hair, feeling for a good grip. He leaned menacingly toward Roger, who, chin resting on the table, regarded him apathetically. "'Hold it!' Meg called sharply. "'Flock of multiple urgents coming in. News liaison. Information bureaus swamped with flying bread inquiries. Aero express lines. Clear our airways or face lawsuit. U.S. Army. Why do loaves flame when hit by incendiary bullets? U.S. Customs. If bread intended for export, get export license or face prosecution. Russian Consulate in Chicago, advise on destination of breadlift. And some Kansas church is accusing us of a hoax inciting to blasphemy, of faking miracles. I don't know why." The business girl tore off her headphones. "'Roger Snedden!' she cried with a hysteria that would have dumbfounded her underlings. "'You've brought the name of Puffy Loaf in front of the whole world, all right. Now do something about the situation. Roger nodded obediently, but his pallor increased a shade, the pupils of his eyes disappeared under the upper lids, and his head burrowed beneath his forearms. "'Oh, boy!' Rose Thinker called gaily to Tin Philosopher. "'This looks like the start of a real crisis session. Did you remember to bring spare batteries?' Meanwhile, the monstrous flight of puffy loaves, filling midwestern skies as no small flyers had since the days of the passenger pigeon, soared steadily onward. Private flyers approached the brown and glistening bread front in curiosity, and dipped back in awe. Aero express lines organized sightseeing flights along the flanks. Planes of the government forestry and agricultural services, and copters bearing the puffy loaf emblem, hovered on the fringes, watching developments and waiting for orders. A squadron of supersonic fighters hung menacingly above. The behaviour of birds varied considerably. Most fled, or gave the loaves a wide berth, but some bolder species, discovering the minimal nutritive nature of the translucent brown objects, attacked them furiously with beaks and claws. Hydrogen, diffusing slowly through the crusts, had now distended most of the sealed plastic wrappers into little balloons, 
which ruptured when pierced, with disconcerting pops. Below, neck-craning citizens crowded streets and backyards, cranks and cultists had a field day, while local and national governments raged indiscriminately at Puffyloaf and at each other. Rumours that a fusion weapon would be exploded in the midst of the flying bread drew angry protests from conservationists, and a flood of Telefax pamphlets titled H. Loaf or H. Bomb. Stockholm sent a mystifying note of praise to the United Nations Food Organization. Delhi issued nervous denials of a millet blight that no one had heard of until that moment, and reaffirmed India's ability to feed her population with no outside help except the usual. Radio Moscow asserted that the Kremlin would brook no interference in its treatment of the Ukrainians, jokingly referred to the flying bread as a farce perpetrated by mad internationalists inhabiting cloud cuckoo land, added contradictory references to airborne bread booby-trapped by capitalist gangsters, and then fell moodily silent on the whole topic. Radio Venus reported to its winged audience that Earth's inhabitants were establishing food depots in the upper air preparatory to taking up permanent aerial residence, such as we have always enjoyed on Venus. New New York made feverish preparations for the passage of flying bread. Tickets for sightseeing space in skyscrapers were sold at high prices. Cold meats and potted spreads were hawked to viewers, with the assurance that they would be able to snag the bread out of the air and enjoy a historic sandwich. Phineas T. Grice, escaping from his own managerial suite, raged about the city, demanding general cooperation in the stretching of great nets between the skyscrapers to trap the errant loaves. He was captured by Tin Philosopher, escaped again, and was found posted with oxygen mask and submachine gun on the topmost spire of Puffy Loaf Tower, apparently determined to shoot down the loaves as they appeared, and before they involved his company in more trouble with customs and the State Department. Recaptured by Tin Philosopher, who suffered only minor bullet holes, he was given a series of mild electroshocks, and returned to the conference table, calm and clear-headed as ever. But the bread flight, swinging away from a hurricane moving up the Atlantic coast, crossed a clouded in Boston by night, and disappeared into a high Atlantic overcast, also thereby evading a local storm generated by the weather department in a last-minute effort to bring down, or at least disperse the H loaves. Warnings and counter-warnings by communist and capitalist governments seriously interfered with military trailing of the flight during this period, and it was actually lost touch with for several days. At scattered points, seagulls were observed fighting over individual loaves floating down from the grey roof. That was all. A mood of spirituality strongly tinged with humour seized the people of the world. Ministers sermonised about the bread variously interpreting it as a call to charity, a warning against gluttony, a parable of the evanescence of all earthly things, and a divine joke. Husbands and wives, facing each other across their walls of breakfast toast, burst into laughter. The mere sight of a loaf of bread anywhere was enough to evoke guffaws. An obscure sect, having as part of its creed the injunction, Don't take yourself so damn seriously one new adherence. The bread flight, rising above an Atlantic storm widely reported to have destroyed it, passed unobserved across a foggy England, and rose out of the overcast only over middle Europa. The loaves had at last reached their maximum altitude. The sun's rays beat through the rarefied air on the distended plastic wrappers, increasing still further the pressure of the confined hydrogen. They burst by the millions and tens of millions. A high-flying Bulgarian evangelist, who had happened to mistake the up-lever for the east-lever in the cockpit of his flyer, and who was the sole witness of the event, afterward described it as the foaming of a sea of diamonds, the crackle of God's knuckles. By the millions and tens of millions, the loaves coasted down into the starving Ukraine shaken by a week of humour that threatened to invade even its own grim precincts, the Kremlin made a sudden about-face. A new policy was instituted of communal ownership of the produce of communal farms, and teams of hunger-fighters and caravans of trucks loaded with pumpernickel were dispatched into the Ukraine. 
world distribution was given to a series of photographs showing peasants queuing up to trade scavenged puffy loaves for traditional black bread, recently aerated itself, but still extra solid by comparison, the rate of exchange demanded by the Moscow teams being twenty puffy loaves to one of pumpernickel. Another series of photographs, picturing chubby workers' children being blown to bits by booby-trapped bread, was quietly destroyed. Congratulatory notes were exchanged by various national governments and world organizations, including the Brotherhood of Free Business Machines. The great bread flight was over, though for several weeks afterward scattered falls of loaves occurred, giving rise to a new folklore of manner among lonely Arabian tribesmen, and in one well-authenticated instance in Tibet, sustaining life in a party of mountaineers cut off by a snowslide. Back in New New York, the managerial board of Puffy Products slumped in utter collapse around the conference table. The long crisis session at last ended. Empty coffee cartons were scattered around the chairs of the three humans, dead batteries around those of the two machines. For a while there was no movement whatsoever. Then Roger Snedden reached out wearily for the earphones, where Megera Winterly had hurled them down, adjusted them to his head, pushed a button, and listened apathetically. After a bit his gaze brightened. He pushed more buttons and listened more eagerly. Soon he was sitting tensely upright on his stool, eyes bright and lower face all a smile, muttering terse comments and questions into the lapel mic torn from Meg's fair neck. The others, reviving, watched him, at first dully, then with quickening interest, especially when he jerked off the earphones with a happy shout and sprang to his feet. "'Listen to this!' he cried in a ringing voice. "'As a result of the worldwide publicity, puffy loaves are outselling fairy bread three to one, and that's just the old carbon dioxide stock from our freezers. It's almost exhausted, but the government, now that the Ukrainian crisis is over, has taken the ban off helium, and will also sell us stockpiled wheat if we need it. We can have our walking mills burrowing into the wheat caves in a matter of hours. But that isn't all. The far greater demand everywhere is for puffy loaves that will actually float. Public Relations, Child Liaison Division, reports that the kiddies are making their mothers' lives miserable about it. If only we can figure out some way to make hydrogen non-explosive, or the helium loaf float just a little. I'm sure we can take care of that quite handily. Tin philosopher interrupted briskly. Puffy Loaf has kept it a corporation secret, even you've never been told about it. But just before he went crazy, Everett Whitehead discovered a way to make bread using only half as much flour as we do in the present loaf. Using this secret technique, which we've been saving for just such an emergency, it will be possible to bake a helium loaf as buoyant in every respect as the hydrogen loaf. Good, Roger cried. We'll tether them on strings and sell them like balloons. No mother-child shopping team will leave the store without a cluster. Buying bread balloons will be the big event of the day for kiddies. It'll make the carry-home shopping load lighter, too. I'll issue orders at once." He broke off, looking at Phineas T. Grice, said with quiet assurance, "'Excuse me, sir, if I seem to be taking too much upon myself.' "'Not at all, son. Go straight ahead,' the great manager said approvingly. You're he laughed in anticipation of getting off a memorable remark, rising to the challenging situation like a genuine puffy loaf. Megara Winterly looked from the older man to the younger. Then in a single leap she was upon Roger, her arms wrapped tightly around him. "'My sweet little ever-victorious self-propelled monkey-wrench!' she crooned in his ear. Roger looked fatuously over her soft shoulder a tin philosopher who, as if moved by some similar feeling, reached over and touched claws with Rose Thinker. This, however, was what he telegraphed silently to his fellow machine, across the circuit so completed. Good o, Rosie. That makes another victory for robot-engineered world unity, though you almost gave us away at the start with that bread-overhead jingle. We've struck another blow against the next world war, in which, as we know only too well, we machines would suffer the most. Now, if we can only arrange, say, a fur famine in Alaska, 
and a migration of long-haired Siberian lemmings across Bering Straits. We'd have to swing the Japanese current up there so it'd be warm enough for the little fellows. Anyhow, Rosie, with a spot of help from the Brotherhood, those humans will paint themselves into the Peace Corner yet. Meanwhile, he and Rose Thinker quietly watched the blonde icicle melt. End of Bread Overhead by Fritz Lieber The Butterfly's Ball by R. M. Ballantyne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Carolyn Francis The Butterfly's Ball, Chapter 1 Come take up your hats, and away let us haste To the butterfly's ball and the grasshopper's feast, For the trumpeter gadfly has summoned his crew, And the revels are now only waiting for you. On the smooth-shaven grass by the side of the wood, Beneath a broad oak that for ages has stood, See the children of earth and the tenants of air For an evening's amusement together repair. And there came the beetle, so blind and so black, Who carried the emmet, his friend, on his back. And there came the gnat and the dragonfly too, And all their relations, green, orange, and blue. And there came the moth with her plumage of down, And the hornet with jacket of yellow and brown, Who with him the wasp his companion did bring. They promised that evening to lay by their sting. Then the sly little dormouse peeped out of his hole, and led to the feast his blind cousin, the mole. And the snail, with her horns peeping out from her shell, came fatigued with the distance, the length of an L. A mushroom the table, and on it was spread a water-dock leaf, which their tablecloth made. The viands were various to each of their taste, and the bee brought the honey to sweeten the feast. With steps more majestic the snail did advance, and he promised the gazers a minuet dance. But they all laughed so loudly he pulled in his head, and went in his own little chamber to bed. Then as evening gave way to the shadows of night, their watchman, the glow-worm, came out with his light. So home let us hasten while yet we can see, for no watchman is waiting for you or for me. CHAPTER Two, THE BUTTERFLY'S BALL AND THE GRASSHOPPER'S FEAST Come take up your hats and away let us haste To the butterfly's ball and the grasshopper's feast For the trumpet of gadfly has summoned his crew And the revels are now only waiting for you Revels are now only waiting for you on the smooth-shaven grass by the side of the wood, Beneath the broad oak that for ages has stood, See the children of earth and the tenants of air, For an evening's amusement together repair, An evening's amusement together repair. It was very early one delightful morning in summer, when the trumpeter gadfly sounded his horn, inviting all the insects in the forest to the butterfly's ball and the grasshopper's feast. The sun shone brightly, the air was mild and soft, and the scent of the wildflowers delicious, so that not one of the insects thought of staying at home. Butterflies, beetles, bees, wasps, snails, grasshoppers, ants, all put on their best coats and frocks, all put on their sweetest smiles, and all hurried off in little bands to the ball, talking and laughing and humming and buzzing by the way, as if they were the happiest creatures in the wide world. Even the old beetle, that had been run over by a cartwheel and squeezed nearly to death, got out of bed when he heard what was going on, and limped along with the rest, though he had been confined to the house for six months before one or two butterflies that were never known to go out except in the very finest weather 
and even then, carefully wrapped up, determined to venture. They were long in making up their minds about it. One thought it looked a very little like rain. Another feared that the light breeze might give them a cold. However, they put on a great many cloaks and went. From all directions they came, and assembled on a smooth grassy spot under an old oak tree where the revels were to take place. Some crawled slowly along the ground, some bounded quickly over hill and dale, some came running and tumbling, jumping and hitting against things in their haste, some came swiftly through the air and alighted so suddenly as to tumble head over heels, others flew quietly to the scene and fluttered lightly about admiring the gay company they were about to join. And there came the beetle so blind and so black, who carried the emmet, his friend on his back. And there came the gnat and the dragonfly too, and all their relations, green, orange, and blue. All their relations, green, orange, and blue. The black beetle was the first to make his appearance. He carried his dear friend the emmet on his back, and a sad journey they had of it, to be sure. Being very blind, the beetle was constantly falling over twigs, knocking his shins against the edges of leaves, and tumbling into ditches, so that the poor emmet had many terrible falls and once the great beetle fell on top of him and crushed him a good deal. But it was very pleasant to see how cheerful they were under all this. On getting up after a fall, the beetle always laughed so boisterously that the tears ran down his cheeks, and his black sides nearly cracked, while the little emmet said gaily, "'Oh, my friend, accidents will happen. Not hurt, I hope. Come get along once more.' and then he jumped up on his friend's back again, and away they went as merrily as ever. A gnat and a dragonfly with a great many of their relations arrived about the same time with the beetle. They looked quite charming in their brilliant dresses, the colors of which were chiefly green, orange, and blue. A large blue-bottle fly with a very light waistcoat and a hat stuck on one side of his head said that the dragonflies were lovely and that Miss Nat was quite killing. This was an odd thing to say, but Mr. Bluebottle meant by it that she was very beautiful. Indeed, it was said that he fell in love with Miss Nat, for he danced with nobody else during the whole afternoon. And there came the moth with her plumage of dawn, and the hornet with jacket of yellow and brown. Who with him the wasp his companion did bring, and they promised that evening to lay by their sting. Promised that evening to lay by their sting. The moth was sound asleep when the gadfly blew his trumpet. She had sat up too late the night before, and owing to having indulged this bad habit, had overslept herself the following morning. However, she tried by her activity to make up for lost time. She saw the other insects hurrying past her home in crowds, so she threw on her clothes as fast as possible. The moth was prettily dressed in a soft garment of down, and as she was a modest creature, everyone loved her. On leaving home, she observed the wasp and the hornet passing. They were dressed in rich suits of brown and yellow. At the sight of them she was a little frightened, and endeavored to run back to her house until they should pass by. But they caught sight of her, and immediately gave chase, screaming out loudly, "'Oh, dear Mrs. Moth, pray don't be alarmed. We have laid by our stings for today and won't harm you.' They soon caught her, although she ran as fast as she could. So the wasp and the hornet each offered her an arm, and obliged her to walk between them while they danced along shouting and singing and winking waggishly to the friends they passed on the road. The poor moth 
blushed very much at being seen by all her friends in the company of two such wild creatures. A caterpillar and a long-legged beetle, besides one or two other insects that chanced to be near, laughed very heartily on seeing what had happened. But the moth soon recovered her spirits, and when they arrived at the oak tree, she was walking along with a sprightly step, first talking to the hornet, and then chatting to the wasp, as if they were her dearest friends. Then the sly little dormouse peeped out of his hole, and led to the feast his blind cousin the mole. And the snail with her horns peeping out from her shell, came fatigued with the distance the length of an L. Fatigued with the distance the length of an L. Come along, you lazy fellow, cried the little dormouse, knocking with his ivory-headed cane at the door of the molehill. Ay, ay, cousin, shouted the mole. I'll be there in a minute. So the dormouse stood impatiently tapping his boots till the mole should be ready. The dormouse was dressed in the height of fashion and thought himself a rather handsome fellow. Some people said that he was conceited, and indeed a spider that was near at hand plainly told him so. But whether this was true or not, there is no doubt that he was a very kind little fellow because he came to lead his poor blind cousin to the feast. "'What a time you have been, old boy,' he said, as the mole appeared, dusting the earth off his coat and white hat. The mole answered that he had been very busy all morning, making a new tunnel between his bedroom and drawing-room. He then took his friend's arm, and away they went over the green meadows, where the cowslips and buttercups grew, making the grass look as if it were dotted all over with gold. Sometimes the two friends stop by the way to rest under a buttercup and sip a little morning dew. But seeing everyone hastening past them, while they wasted their time, the dormouse jumped up again and cast a sly look at his blind friend as he asked him what he thought of the fine view. "'Don't make jokes about my being blind,' said the mole, pretending to be angry. Just at that moment they both ran into a spider's web. Oh, how stupid of me, cried the dormouse. I wasn't looking before me at the time. You might as well be without eyes if you don't use them, said the mole, as they cleared away the threads of the net, and making a low bow to the spider, went on their way. Now all this time the snail had been slowly creeping over the stones and winding round the blades of grass and flowers that strewed her path to the place of meeting. But she was so long of getting there that the guests began to be impatient and said that perhaps she was not coming at all. She lived under the next tree and had only about four feet to walk, but she was so very slow that she took a long, long time to it. And at last the grasshopper whispered to the butterfly that she should go and meet her. Away went the butterfly on her gaudy wings and alighting by the snail's side began to urge her to make haste. During the butterfly's absence, the wasp, who was always making spiteful remarks, said that it was shameful in the snail to keep them waiting. But the humble bee, who was walking up and down conversing with a midge, turned round and said, Remember, you wasp, that you have not brought your sting with you today, so pray do not give way to your spiteful nature. The poor snail has to carry her house on her back, so we should not be angry at her slowness. Some of the other insects said that this was no excuse for the snail, because she knew that she walked very slowly and should therefore have set out sooner. Come, come, cried a young frog, jumping forward. No fighting today, ladies and gentlemen. We have come here to be happy. And here comes the snail at last. As he spoke, the butterfly flew towards them, and the snail crawled in, took off her bonnet, put on her spectacles, and sat down, while the waiters bustled about, placed stools for the guests, and brought in the repast. A mushroom the table, and on it was spread, 
A water duck lives with their tablecloth made. The viands were various to each of their taste, and the bee brought the honey to sweeten the feast. The bee brought the honey to sweeten the feast. It was perhaps the strangest dinner party that ever was seen. There were such a multitude of odd creatures of all shapes and sizes and colors, some of whom were by nature bitter enemies, and would have fought and killed each other had they met in the woods while taking a walk, but were quite civil and polite to one another now that they met at guests in Mrs. Butterfly's bower. Indeed, many of them wished that they could be such good friends at all times as they were then. All the party had now arrived, and there was a great deal of talking, and buzzing, and humming, and jesting, as they sat round the table and feasted on the good things placed before them. The table was a mushroom, covered with a tablecloth of water dock leaf, and on it were placed all the delicious dishes of the woods. The dormouse brought a good deal of wheat, oats, and barley. The squirrel brought a bag full of nuts. The humblebee brought a quantity of fine honey in the comb, which was declared to be most excellent. In short, everyone brought something or other, so that when all was spread out beside the good things supplied by Mrs. Butterfly and Mr. Grasshopper, it seemed the grandest feast that ever was heard of. Such fun there was, to be sure, and such a multitude of voices talking all at once. My dear! cried the butterfly across the table to the grasshopper. I hope you are attending to your friends there. See that you give them enough to eat, and plenty of mountain dew to drink. Yes, yes, my love, replied the grasshopper, as well as he could for laughing at the jokes of a bloated old spider that sat beside him. Then the grasshopper called to the butterfly to send him a slice of wheat. But as the noise prevented his being heard, he jumped over the table at one bound, helped himself, and bounded back again. Two or three young crickets and five or six midges sat at a little side mushroom. They made more noise than all the grown-up people put together, and the lady butterfly looked round at them with a smile once or twice, quite delighted to see them so happy and to hear their merry voices ringing through the woods. With steps more majestic, the snail did advance, and he promised the gazer a minuet dance. But they all laughed so loudly, he pulled in his head, and went in his own little chamber to bed. Went in his own little chamber to bed. After dinner the ball began, and it was the strangest ball that ever was seen. The trumpeter gadfly and a number of his relations, besides several grasshoppers and bees, were the chief musicians. They wanted a bass very much at first, but the bullfrog offered his services, although he confessed that he was accustomed to sing alone. Then the gentlemen drew on their gloves, flattened their wings, pulled up their collars and coiled away their tails, while the ladies tightened their garters, ruffled their feathers, and put out their feelers. Oh, how they did dance! Reels were nothing to it. The greatest difficulty was to keep the grasshoppers in order. They became so excited that they sprang quite out of sight every moment, and so lost their partners, and ran against everybody in searching for them. Then the bullfrog, who sang bass, got a little too much of the dew, and sang so loudly that he quite drowned all the other players. So Mrs. Butterfly put her claws in her ears, and running up to him said, Oh, dear Mr. Bullfrog, pray do not sing quite so loudly. The poor bullfrog was almost weeping with joy at the merry scene before him, but he blushed very green on hearing this, and said he had forgotten what he was doing but would try to be more careful. However, in five minutes more he was worse than ever, so they sent a few hundred bees to sing treble beside him, 
and try to keep him in order. In the middle of all this there was a sudden stop, and a snail, stepping forward, offered to dance a minuet. This was received with such a roar of laughter that the poor snail, half frightened, half angry, drew in his horns and went to bed on the spot, and the dance was begun anew. By this time the gnats and the midges and some of the other flies had left the ground and retired to enjoy a cool dance in the air. Two or three spiders mounted up into the oak and fastened threads to some of the branches, by which they dropped suddenly down among the dancers, and seizing their partners round the waist, carried them screaming in among the leaves. So the fun and the noise became louder and louder. On the ground, under the bushes, among the branches of the trees, and in the air, the dancers bounded, skipped, laughed, sang, shouted, and flew in a way that had never been seen or heard of before. The merry old bullfrog became quite absurd. He sang and roared like a lion, took up all the young insects in his arms and hugged them, tumbled over the other musicians, and in short, did so many wild things that they were at length obliged to tie him to a paddock stool where they left him to enjoy himself. Then as evening gave way to shadows of night, their watchman the glowworm came out with his light. So home let us hasten while yet we can see, for no watchman is waiting for you or for me. No watchman is waiting for you or for me. The sun went down at last. But still the dancers continued their sport under the old oak tree, when suddenly a clear, beautiful light streamed across the turf. It was the glowworm's light. How charming, exclaimed the butterfly. It is such a sweet, subdued light. Rather too much subdued, growled the blundering black beetle as he tripped over a twig and pulled his partner a humblebee down with him. Couldn't you shine a little brighter, eh? The glowworm shook his head. Couldn't give you another ray to save my life, he said. But if you send for a few of my friends, they will be happy to come and help me, no doubt. A good suggestion, said the black beetle, assisting his partner to rise. Oh, my poor frock, cried the humble bee, gazing sadly at a long rent in the skirt. Never mind, let's have at it again, cried the beetle, seizing her round the waist and blundering on again in a furious gallop of his own invention. "'Whom shall I send for the glowworm's relations?' muttered the butterfly to herself. "'Send the snail,' said a lively young cricket, who had devoted himself to doing mischief during the whole evening. "'Peace, little goose,' replied the butterfly, tapping the cricket on the nose with her fan, and hastening towards the grasshopper who was still enthralled and convulsed by the bloated old spider. "'Whom shall we send, my dear?' said the grasshopper in reply to the butterfly's question. "'The fly-footman, to be sure. And pray tell him to be smart about it, for I've been run down half a dozen times already by the dancers since the sun set. One lamp is too little for our ballroom. That blind old mole has run. Ha! Huh, there he comes again! Look out!' As he spoke, the mole came bearing down towards them in a furious Portuguese waltz, with a horrified dragonfly struggling in his arms. The grasshopper made a bound to get out of the way, but at that moment the lively young cricket laid hold of his leg and held him fast. The consequence was that the mole tumbled over him, fell on the top of the bloated spider, and hit his head so violently on the breast of the bullfrog that he stopped his noise immediately. This sudden stoppage of the bass brought the other musicians to a stand, and as a matter of course, stopped the dancing abruptly, with the exception of a deaf squirrel who had failed to find a partner, and who went on revolving slowly by himself as if nothing had happened. "'Dear me!' exclaimed everybody, except the squirrel. "'What has happened?' "'Oh, nothing worth mentioning,' said the grasshopper, getting up with a limp. You young rascal, what, why, 
There, take that. Oh, sobbed the young cricket, pointing with a look of surprise at the spider. What a sight! He might well say so, for the bloated old spider had been flattened out by the weight of the mole to nearly twice her size, and was apparently quite dead. In great concern, the host and hostess ran to raise her. "'Are you hurt, dear?' asked the butterfly anxiously. "'Hurt!' exclaimed the grasshopper, pushing her aside. "'Don't you see she's burst?' "'Oh, me! I'm so sorry!' exclaimed the mole, wringing his forepaws. At that moment there was a shout of eager expectation, for the spider was seen to move. The butterfly knelt at her side and, bending down, said tenderly, "'Tell me, dear, has he burst you?' N no n not qu qu quite answered the spider faintly i'm only f flattened let some of you s squeeze m my sides immediately a dozen of the young crickets surrounded the old lady and pressed her sides with all their might this had the effect of raising her back a little and enabling her to draw a good long breath which speedily raised her up to her original size there i'm all right now she said in a cheerful voice i'm used to accidents of that sort and they never leave any bad effects beyond a little stiffness of the lungs come grasshopper i'll finish that story get on with your dancing good people nobody inquires after me croaked the bullfrog rubbing his chest i had no idea a mole's head was so hard have some mountain dew said the butterfly, gracefully handing him a bluebell filled with the precious liquid. It has been gathered on the Scottish hills by a native bee, who has just arrived laden with heather honey. The bullfrog accepted the goblet and drained it to the bottom. It is strong, he said, coughing and smacking his lips. Oh, aye, observed the Scotch bee. It's got the great credit of being a wee thing nippy. Under the influence of the dew, the bullfrog began to sing bass lustily. The other musicians chimed in. The dancers seized each other by waist and hand, or by tail and wing, those that happened to have no waists or hands. And the ball was about to go on when the grasshopper shouted, Stop! Your money or your life, added the lively young cricket. Silence, pert monkey. Let us wait a few moments, my friends, for here come our lamps. As she spoke, a soft light was seen in the far distance gleaming upon the stems of the trees and steadily advancing. "'Your relations, Mr. Glowworm, I presume,' said the butterfly in a sweet, silvery voice. "'It is so very kind of you to send for them, and so obliging in them to come. Really, I cannot find words to express my gratitude.' The countenance of the glowworm lighted up with pleasure at these words. As the newcomers drew near, they appeared like a great galaxy of minute stars, as if a mass of the Milky Way had been cut off and hurled down to earth. There were several hundreds of them. As they approached, the whole forest lighted up, and when at last they descended upon the scene of the ball and ranged themselves in a circle round the gay party, it seemed as if the sun himself had risen again to give them light. Only the radiance was softer and more mysteriously tender than that of the sun. Strong light has always an enlivening effect on creatures, whether human or otherwise. It cheered up the guests of Mrs. Butterfly so much that they gave vent to an irresistible cheer, called for the music, and went on to dancing with more zest and energy than ever insomuch that the attendant glowworms smiled to each other and nodded their heads. Now it happened that every time the glowworms smiled their light increased. The lively young cricket observed this and began to wonder whether their light would increase still more if they were to laugh. I'll try to find out, he said, going up to a small glowworm, apparently a young one, and requesting her to step aside with him for a moment. The little glowworm immediately became grave, in other words, dim, and went with him a little way into the woods. Now, said the lively young cricket, stopping, can you laugh? 
"'What?' said the little glowworm, smiling, and of course lighting up. "'Yes, that's it. Smile away. But do it harder. I want you to laugh outright. Can't you laugh?' "'Oh, yes, when there is anything to laugh at. Well, do it now. But I can't, please. No, then I'll make you. So saying, the young cricket seized the little glowworm round the waist and tickled her. Of course, she laughed at first, and to the cricket's delight, her face became wonderfully bright for a moment. But suddenly it became dim, for he hurt her, and she began to cry. You rascal! exclaimed an angry voice as the grasshopper gave the cricket a kick that sent him head over heels into the grass. I felt sure you were after mischief, and I was right. Oh, please don't kick him, pleaded the little glowworm. He didn't mean to hurt me. No matter. Get up, sir, and beg her pardon. The young cricket got up at once and did what he was bid, for he really did not mean mischief and was sorry he had hurt her. And little Miss Glowworm rewarded him with a smile so radiant that it illuminated the spot where they stood quite brilliantly and sparkled through her tears with rainbow hues. Now I would laugh to please you if I could, said Miss Glowworm, again smiling. Oh, never mind, my dear. I'll make you and all your kindred laugh before the ball is over said the lively young cricket, hurrying away and going straight up to the Scotch bee, who was clad in a tartan plaid and kilt. Bee, said the cricket, can you dance the highland fling? Aye, she can do that. I could show you a better fling than the highland one, said the cricket. Ho, oh, could ye? You must be very clever. Will you let her see it? Yes, if you'll dance the highland fling first. Will you do it if Mrs. Butterfly asks you?" The Scotch bee good-naturedly agreed. Of course, the cricket had no difficulty in persuading the hostess to ask him. The musicians could not play a wheel, but this mattered not, for the bee could hum to himself. Great was the delight and surprise of the company when they beheld the Scotch bee twirling his legs, snapping his fingers, and humming the reel of Turlock while the tartans fluttered round him like shreds of a shattered rainbow. The dance waxed more and more furious, and the plaudits of the company grew louder when suddenly the lively young cricket ran in between the bee's legs, tripped him up, and sent him sprawling on the grass. A wild shout of laughter burst from the company, glowworms included, and the ballroom brightened up for a few moments as if it had been set on fire. That's the fling I spoke of, cried the cricket, leaping up and running away. The Scotch bee sprang up, drew his dirk, and gave chase. But Mr. Grasshopper caught him by the arm and dragged him off. Ho, oh, friends, supper, supper, this way. Don't sheath your dirk. I have a haggis ready for you to sheath it in. Come along, give your arm to that bloated old spider there. She'll keep you in spirits. The bee was mollified. He gave his arm to the spider, then all the company went off to sup in a neighboring glade. Shall we describe the supper? We think not. It was beyond description delightful. Just as it was finished, the moon rose from behind a cloud, so the company knew that it was time to go home. Before going away, they all assembled at the foot of the oak and shook claws with Lady Butterfly and Mr. Grasshopper saying that they were charmed with the delightful evening they had spent, and that they hoped to be soon invited again. In a few minutes they were all gone. The sounds of their laughing voices as they returned home died gradually away, and the shadows of night spread over the quiet forest and the happy little creatures that slumbered there. Of the Butterfly's Ball by R. M. Ballantyne. Counterparts from Dubliners by James Joyce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The bell rang furiously, and when Miss Parker went to the tube, a furious voice called out in a piercing North of Ireland accent, "'Send Farrington here!' Miss Parker returned to her machine, saying to a man who was writing at a desk, "'Mr. Elaine wants you upstairs.' The man muttered, "'Blast him!' under his breath, and pushed back his chair to stand up. When he stood up he was tall and of great bulk. He had a hanging face, dark, wine-coloured, with fair eyebrows and moustache. His eyes bulged forward slightly, and the whites of them were dirty. He lifted up the counter, and, passing by the clients, went out of the office with a heavy step. He went heavily upstairs until he came to the second landing, where a door bore a brass plate with the inscription, Mr. Elaine. Here he halted, puffing with labour and vexation, and knocked. The shrill voice cried, Come in! The man entered Mr. Elaine's room. Simultaneously, Mr. Elaine, a little man wearing gold-rimmed glasses on a clean-shaven face, shot his head up over a pile of documents. The head itself was so pink and hairless it seemed like a large egg reposing on the papers. Mr. Elaine did not lose a moment. Farrington, what is the meaning of this? Why have I always to complain to you? May I ask you why you haven't made a copy of that contract between Bodley and Kerwin? I told you it must be ready by four o'clock. But Mr. Shelley said, sir, Mr. Shelley said, sir, kindly attend to what I say and not to what Mr. Shelley says, sir. You always have some excuse or another for shirking work. Let me tell you that if the contract is not copied before this evening, I'll lay the matter before Mr. Crosby. Do you hear me now? Yes, sir. Do you hear me now? Aye, and another little matter. I might as well be talking to the wall as talking to you. Understand once and for all that you get a half an hour for your lunch, and not an hour and a half. How many courses do you want, I'd like to know? Do you mind me now? Yes, sir. Mr. Lane bent his head again upon his pile of papers. The man stared fixedly at the polished skull which directed the affairs of Crosby and Elaine, gauging its fragility. A spasm of rage gripped his throat for a few moments and then passed, leaving after it a sharp sensation of thirst. The man recognised the sensation and felt that he must have a good night's drinking. The middle of the month was passed and, if he could get the copy done in time, Mr. Lane might give him an order on the cashier. He stood still gazing fixedly at the head upon the pile of papers. Suddenly Mr. Lane began to upset all the papers, searching for something. Then, as if he had been unaware of the man's presence till that moment, he shut up his head again, saying, "'Hey, are you going to stand there all day? Upon my word, Farrington, you take things easy.' "'I was waiting to see. Very good, you needn't wait to see. Go downstairs and do your work.' The man walked heavily towards the door, and as he went out of the room he heard Mr. Lane cry after him, that if the contract was not copied by evening Mr. Crosby would hear of the matter. He returned to his desk in the lower office and counted the sheets which remained to be copied. He took up his pen and dipped it in the ink, but he continued to stare stupidly at the last words he had written. In no case shall the said Bernard Bodley be. The evening was falling, and in a few minutes they would be lighting the gas, then he could write. He felt that he must slake the thirst in his throat. He stood up from his desk and, lifting the counter as before, passed out of the office. As he was passing out, the chief clerk looked at him inquiringly. "'It's all right, Mr. Shelley,' said the man, pointing with his finger to indicate the objective of his journey. The chief clerk glanced at the hat-rack, but, seeing the row complete, offered no remark. As soon as he was on the landing, the man pulled a shepherd's plaid cap out of his pocket, put it on his head, and ran quickly down the rickety stairs. From the street door he walked on furtively on the inner side of the path towards the corner and all at once dived into a doorway. He was now safe in the dark snug of O'Neill's shop, and, filling up the little window that looked into the bar with his inflamed face, the colour of dark wine or dark meat, he called out, "'Here, Pat, give us a GP like a good fella." The curate brought him a glass of plain porter. The man drank it at a gulp and asked for a caraway seed. He put his penny on the counter, and, leaving the curate to grope for it in the gloom, retreated out of the snug as furtively as he had entered it. Darkness, accompanied by a thick fog, was gaining upon the dusk of February, and the lamps in Eustace Street had been lit. The man went up by the houses until he reached the door of the office, wondering whether he could finish his copy in time. 
On the stairs a moist, pungent odour of perfumes saluted his nose. Evidently Miss Delacour had come while he was out in O'Neill's. He crammed his cap back again into his pocket and re-entered the office, assuming an air of absent-mindedness. "'Mr. Elaine has been calling for you,' said the chief clerk severely. "'Where were you?' The man glanced at the two clients who were standing at the counter, as if to intimate that their presence prevented him from answering. As the clients were both male, the chief clerk allowed himself a laugh. "'I know that game,' he said. Five times in one day is a little bit. Well, you'd better look sharp and get a copy of our correspondence in the Delacour case for Mr. Elaine. The address in the presence of the public, his run upstairs, and the porter he had gulped down so hastily confused the man, and as he sat down at his desk to get what was required, he realised how hopeless was the task of finishing his copy of the contract before half-past five. The dark, damp night was coming, and he longed to spend it in the bars, drinking with his friends amid the glare of gas and the clatter of glasses. He got out the Delacour correspondence and passed out of the office. He hoped Mr. Lane would not discover that the last two letters were missing. The moist, pungent perfume lay all the way up to Mr. Lane's room. Miss Delacour was a middle-aged woman of Jewish appearance. Mr. Lane was said to be sweet on her, or on her money. She came to the office often, and stayed a long time when she came. She was sitting beside his desk now in an aroma of perfumes, smoothing the handle of her umbrella and nodding the great black feather in her hat. Mr. Elaine had swivelled his chair round to face her and thrown his right foot jauntily upon his left knee. The man put the correspondence on the desk and bowed respectfully, but neither Mr. Elaine or Miss Delacour took any notice of his bow. Mr. Elaine tapped a finger on the correspondence and then flicked it towards him as if to say, "'That's all right, you can go.' The man returned to the lower office and sat down again at his desk. He stared intently at the incomplete phrase, In no case shall the said Bernard Bodley be, and thought how strange it was that the last three words began with the same letter. The chief clerk began to hurry Miss Parker, saying she would never have the letters typed in time for post. The man listened to the clicking of the machine for a few minutes, and then set to work to finish his copy. But his head was not clear and his mind wandered away to the glare and rattle of the public house. It was a night for hot punches. He struggled on with his copy, but when the clock struck five he had fourteen pages to write. Blasted, he couldn't finish it in time. He longed to execrate aloud, to bring his fist down on something violently. He was so enraged that he wrote Bernard, Bernard instead of Bernard Bodley, and had to begin again on a clean sheet. He felt strong enough to clear out the whole office single-handed. His body ached to do something, to rush out and revel in violence. All the indignities of his life enraged him. Could he ask the cashier privately for an advance? No, the cashier was no good, no damn good. He wouldn't give an advance. He knew where he would meet the boys, Leonard and O'Halloran and Nosy Flynn. The barometer of his emotional nature was set for a spell of riot. His imagination had so abstracted him that his name was called twice before he answered. Mr. Lane and Miss Delacour were standing outside the counter, and all the clerks had turned round in anticipation of something. The man got up from his desk. Mr. Lane began a tirade of abuse, saying that two letters were missing. The man answered that he knew nothing about them, that he had made a faithful copy. The tirade continued. It was so bitter and violent that the man could hardly restrain his fist from descending upon the head of the mannequin before him. I know nothing about any other two letters, he said stupidly. You know nothing? Of course you know nothing, said Mr. Elaine. Tell me, he added, glancing first for approval to the lady beside him. Do you take me for a fool? Do you think me another fool? The man glanced from the lady's face to the little egg-shaped head and back again, and almost before he was aware of it, his tongue had found a felicitous moment. I don't think, sir, he said, that that's a fair question to put to me. There was a pause in the very breathing of the clerks. Everyone was astounded, the author of the witticism no less than his neighbours, and Miss Delacour, who was a stout, amiable person, began to smile broadly. Mr. Lane flushed to the hue of a wild rose, and his mouth twitched with a dwarf's passion. He shook his fist in the man's face till it seemed to vibrate like the knob of some electric machine.
You impertinent ruffian. You impertinent ruffian. I'll make short work out of you. Wait till you see. You'll apologise to me for your impertinence or you'll quit the office. Instanter. You'll quit this, I'm telling you, or you'll apologise to me. He stood in a doorway opposite the office, watching to see if the cashier would come out alone. All the clerks passed out, and finally the cashier came out with the chief clerk. It was no use trying to say a word to him when he was with the chief clerk. The man felt that his position was bad enough. He had been obliged to offer an abject apology to Mr. Lane for his impertinence, but he knew what a hornet's nest the office would be for him. He could remember the way in which Mr. Lane had hounded Little Peak out of the office in order to make room for his own nephew. He felt savage and thirsty and revengeful, annoyed with himself and with everyone else. Mr. Lane would never give him an hour's rest. His life would be a hell to him. He had made a proper fool of himself this time. Could he not keep his tongue in check? But they had never pulled together from the first, he and Mr. Lane. Ever since the day Mr. Lane had overheard him mimicking his North Farland accent to amuse Higgins and Miss Parker, that had been the beginning of it. He might have tried Higgins for the money, but sure, Higgins never had anything for himself. A man with two establishments to keep up, of course he couldn't. He felt his great body again aching for the comfort of the public house. The fog had begun to chill him, and he wondered could he touch Pat in O'Neill's. He could not touch him for more than a bob, and a bob was no use. Yet he must get money somewhere or other. He had spent his last penny for the GP, and soon it would be too late for getting money anywhere. Suddenly, as he was fingering his watch chain, he thought of Terry Kelly's pawn office in Fleet Street. That was the dart. Why didn't he think of it sooner? He went through the narrow alley of Temple Bar quickly, muttering to himself that they could all go to hell because he was going to have a good night of it. The clerk in Terry Kelly's said, A crown! But the consignor held out for six shillings, and in the end the six shillings was allowed him literally. He came out of the pawn office joyfully, making a little cylinder of the coins between his thumb and fingers. In Westmoreland Street the footpaths were crowded with young men and women returning from business, and ragged urchins ran here and there, yelling out the names of the evening editions. The man passed through the crowd, looking on the spectacle generally with proud satisfaction, and staring masterfully at the office girls. His head was full of the noises of tram gongs and swishing trolleys, and his nose already sniffed the curling fumes of punch. As he walked on, he pre-considered the terms in which he would narrate the incident to the boys. So I just looked at him coolly, you know, and looked at her. Then I looked back at him again, taking my time, you know. I don't think that's a fair question to put to me, says I. Nosy Flynn was sitting up in his usual corner of Davy Burns, and when he heard the story he stood firing to a half one, saying it was as smart a thing as ever he heard. Farrington stood a drink in his turn, and after a while O'Halloran and Paddy Leonard came in, and the story was repeated to them. O'Halloran stood tailors of malt, hot, all round, and told the story of the retort he had made to the chief clerk when he was in Callan's of Found Street, but as the retort was after the manner of the liberal shepherds in the Ecologues, he had to admit that it was not as clever as Farrington's retort. At this Farrington told the boys to polish off that and have another. Just as they were naming their poisons, who should come in but Higgins? Of course he had to join in with the others. The men asked him to give his version of it, and he did so, with great vivacity, for the sight of five small hot whiskies was very exhilarating. Everyone roared laughing when he showed the way in which Mr. Elaine shook his fist in Farrington's face. Then he imitated Farrington, saying, And here was my nabs as cool as you please while Farrington looked at the company out of his heavy, dirty eyes, smiling and at times drawing forth stray drops of liquor from his moustache with the aid of his lower lip. When that round was over there was a pause. O'Halloran had money, but neither of the other two seemed to have any, so the whole party left the shop somewhat regretfully. At the corner of Duke Street Higgins and Nosy Flynn beveled off to the left while the other three turned back towards the city. Rain was drizzling down on the cold streets, and, when they reached the ballast office, Farrington suggested the Scotch house. The bar was full of men, and loud with the noise of tongues and glasses. The three men pushed past the whining match-sellers at the door, and formed a little party at the corner of the counter. They began to exchange stories. Leonard introduced them to a young fellow named Weathers, who was performing at the Tivoli as an acrobat and a knockabout artiste. Farrington stood a drink all round. 
Weathers said he would take a small Irish and a Polinaris. Farrington, who had definite notions of what was what, asked the boys would they have an Apollinaris too, but the boys told Tim to make theirs hot. The talk became theatrical. O'Halloran stood around, and then Farrington stood another round. Weathers protesting that the hospitality was too Irish. He promised to get them in behind the scenes and introduce them to some nice girls. O'Halloran said that he and Leonard would go, but that Farrington wouldn't go because he was a married man, and Farrington's heavy, dirty eyes leered at the company in token that he understood he was being chaffed. Weathers made them all have just one little tincture at his expense and promised to meet them later on at Mulligan's in Poolbeck Street. When the Scotch house closed, they went round to Mulligan's. They went into the parlour at the back, and O'Halloran ordered small hot specials all round. They were all beginning to feel mellow. Farrington was just standing another round when Weathers came back. Much to Farrington's relief, he drank a glass of bitter this time. Funds were getting low, but they had enough to keep them going. Presently, two young women with big hats and a young man in a check suit came in and sat at a table close by. Weathers saluted them and told the company they were out of the Tivoli. Farrington's eyes wandered at every moment in the direction of one of the young women. There was something striking in her appearance. An immense scarf of peacock blue muslin was wound around her hat and knotted in a great bow under her chin, and she wore bright yellow eyes reaching to the elbow. Farrington gazed admiringly at the plump arm which she moved very often and with much grace and when after a little time she answered his gaze he admired still more of her large dark brown eyes the oblique staring expression in them fascinated him she glanced at him once or twice and when the party was leaving the room she brushed against his chair and said oh pardon in a london accent he watched her leave the room in the hope that she would look back at him but he was disappointed he cursed his want of money and cursed all the rounds he had stood particularly all the whiskies and apollinaries which he had stood to weathers. If there was one thing that he hated, it was a sponge. He was so angry that he lost count of the conversation of his friends. When Paddy Leonard called him, he found that they were talking about feats of strength. Weathers was showing his biceps muscle to the company and boasting so much that the other two had called on Farrington to uphold the national honour. Farrington pulled up his sleeve accordingly and showed his biceps muscle to the company. The two arms were examined and compared, and finally it was agreed to have a trial of strength. The table was cleared, and the two men rested their elbows on it, clasping hands. When Paddy Leonard said, Go, each was to try to bring down the other's hand onto the table. Farrington looked very serious and determined. The trial began. After about thirty seconds, Weathers brought his opponent's hand slowly down onto the table. Farrington's dark, wine-coloured face flushed darker still with anger and humiliation at having been defeated by such a stripling. "'You're not to put the weight of your body behind it. Play fair,' he said. "'Who is not playing fair?' said the other. "'Come on again. The two best out of three. The trial began again. The veins stood out on Farrington's forehead, and the pallor of Weathers' complexion changed to peony. Their hands and arms trembled under distress. After a long struggle, Weathers again brought his opponent's hand slowly onto the table. There was a murmur of applause from the spectators. The curate, who was standing beside the table, nodded his red head towards the victor and said with stupid familiarity, "'Ah, uh, that's the knack.' "'What the hell do you know about it?' said Farrington fiercely, turning on the man. "'What do you put in your gab for?' "'Shh, shh,' said O'Halloran, observing the violent expression of Farrington's face. "'Pony up, boys. We'll have just one little smahan more, and then we'll be off.' A very sullen-faced man stood at the corner of O'Connell Bridge, waiting for the little Sandy Mount tram to take him home. He was full of smouldering anger and revengefulness. He felt humiliated and discontented. He did not even feel drunk, and he had only twopence in his pocket. He cursed everything. He had done for himself in the office, pawned his watch, spent all his money, and he had not even got drunk. He began to feel thirsty again, and he longed to go back again to the hot, reeking public house. He had lost his reputation as a strong man, having been defeated twice by a mere boy. His heart swelled with fury, and when he thought of the woman in the big hat who had brushed against him and said, Pardon, his fury nearly choked him. His tram let him down at Shelburne Road, and he steered his great body along in the shadow of the wall of the barracks. He loathed returning to his home. 
When he went in by the side door he found the kitchen empty and the kitchen fire nearly out. He bawled upstairs, Ada! Ada! His wife was a little sharp-faced woman who bullied her husband when he was sober and was bullied by him when he was drunk. They had five children. A little boy came running down the stairs. Who is that? said the man, peering through the darkness. Me, Pa. Who are you, Charlie? No, Pa, Tom. Where's your mother? She's out at the chapel. That's right. Did she think of leaving any dinner for me? Yes, Pa, I... Light the lamp. What do you mean by having the place in darkness? Are the other children in bed? The man sat down heavily on one of the chairs while the little boy lit the lamp. He began to mimic his son's flat accent, saying half to himself, At the chapel, at the chapel, if you please. When the lamp was lit, he banged his fist on the table and shouted, What's for me dinner? I'm going to cook it, Pa, said the little boy. The man jumped up furiously and pointed to the fire. On that fire! You let the fire out! By God, I'll teach you to do that again! He took a step to the door and seized the walking stick which was standing behind it. I'll teach you to let the fire out, he said, rolling up his sleeve in order to give his arm free play. The little boy cried, Oh, Pa! and ran whimpering round the table. But the man followed him and caught him by the coat. The little boy looked about him wildly, but seeing no way of escape, fell upon his knees. Now you'll let the fire out the next time, said the man, striking at him vigorously with the stick. Take that, you little whelp! The boy uttered a squeal of pain as the stick cut his thigh. He clasped his hands together in the air, and his voice shook with fright. Oh, Pa! he cried. Don't beat me, Pa! And I'll... I'll say Hail Mary for you! I'll say Hail Mary for you, Pa, if you don't beat me! I'll say Hail Mary! This ends Counterparts by James Joyce. Evelyn from Dubliners by James Joyce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She sat at the window, watching the evening invade the avenue. Her head was leaned against the window curtains, and in her nostrils was the odour of dusty cretonne. She was tired. Few people passed. The man out of the last house passed on his way home. She heard his footsteps clacking along the concrete pavement, and afterwards crunching on the cinder path before the new red houses. One time there used to be a field there in which they used to play every evening with other people's children. Then a man from Belfast bought the field and built houses in it. Not like their own little brown houses, but bright brick houses with shining roofs. The children of the avenue used to play together in that field, the Devines, the Waters, the Duns, Little killed cripple, she and her brothers and sisters. Ernest, however, never played. He was too grown up. Her father used often to hunt them in out of the field with his blackthorn stick, but usually little Kyo used to keep nicks and call out when he saw her father coming. Still, they seemed to have been rather happy then. Her father was not so bad then, and besides, her mother was alive. That was a long time ago. She and her brothers and sisters were all grown up, her mother was dead. Tizzy Dunn was dead, too, and the waters had gone back to England. Everything changes. Now she was going to go away like the others, to leave her home. Home! She looked round the room, reviewing all its familiar objects, which she had dusted once a week for so many years, wondering where on earth all the dust came from. Perhaps she would never see again those familiar objects from which she had never dreamed of being divided. And yet, during all those years, she had never found out the name of the priest, whose yellowing photograph hung on the wall above the broken harmonium, beside the coloured print of the promises made to blessed Margaret Mary Alacoque. He had been a school friend of her father. Whenever he showed the photograph to a visitor, her father used to pass it with a casual word. He's in Melbourne now. She had consented to go away, to leave her home. Was that wise? She tried to weigh each side of the question. In her home, anyway, she had shelter and food. She had those whom she had known all her life about her. Of course, she had to work hard, both in the house and at business. What would they say of her in the stores when they found out that she had run away with a fellow? Say she was a fool, perhaps, and her place would be filled up by an advertisement. Mrs. Gavin would be glad. She had always an edge on her. 
especially whenever there were people listening. "'Miss Hill, don't you see these ladies are waiting? Look lively, Miss Hill, please!' She would not cry many tears at leaving the stores. But in her new home, in a distant, unknown country, it would not be like that. Then she would be married. She, Evelyn. People would treat her with respect, then. She would not be treated as her mother had been. Even now, though she was over nineteen, she sometimes felt herself in danger of her father's violence. She knew it was that that had given her the palpitations. When they were growing up, he had never gone for her, like he used to go for Harry and Ernest, because she was a girl, but latterly he had begun to threaten her and say what he would do to her only for her dead mother's sake. And now she had nobody to protect her. Ernest was dead, and Harry, who was in the church decorating business, was nearly always down somewhere in the country. Besides, the invariable squabble for money on Saturday nights had begun to weary her unspeakably. She always gave her entire wages, seven shillings, and Harry always sent up what he could, but the trouble was to get any money from her father. He said she used to squander the money, that she had no head, that he wasn't going to give her his hard-earned money to throw about the streets, and much more, for he was usually fairly bad on Saturday night. In the end, he would give her the money and ask her had she any intention of buying Sunday's dinner. Then she had to rush out as quickly as she could and do her marketing, holding her black leather purse tightly in her hand as she elbowed her way through the crowds, and returning home late under her load of provisions. She had hard work to keep the house together, and to see that the two young children who had been left to her charge went to school regularly and got their meals regularly. It was hard work, a hard life, but now that she was about to leave it, she did not find it a wholly undesirable life. She was about to explore another life with Frank. Frank was very kind, manly, open-hearted. She was to go away with him by the night boat to be his wife and to live with him in Buenos Aires, where he had a home waiting for her. How well she remembered the first time she had seen him. He was lodging in a house on the main road where she used to visit. It seemed a few weeks ago. He was standing at the gate, his peaked cap pushed back on his head, and his hair tumbled forward over a face of bronze. Then they had come to know each other. He used to meet her outside the stores every evening and see her home. He took her to see the Bohemian girl, and she felt elated as she sat in an unaccustomed part of the theatre with him. He was awfully fond of music and sang a little. People knew that they were courting, and when he sang about the lass that loves a sailor, she always felt pleasantly confused. He used to call her Poppins out of fun. First of all, it had been an excitement for her to have a fellow, and then she had begun to like him. He had tales of distant countries. He had started as a deck boy at a pound a month on a ship of the Allen Line going out to Canada. He told her the names of the ships he had been on and the names of the different services. He had sailed through the Straits of Magellan and he told her stories of the terrible Patagonians. He had fallen on his feet in Buenos Aires, he said, and had come over to the old country just for a holiday. Of course, her father had found out the affair and had forbidden her to have anything to say to him. I know the sailor chaps, he said. One day he had quarrelled with Frank, and after that she had to meet her lover secretly. The evening deepened in the avenue. The white of two letters in her lap grew indistinct. One was to Harry, the other was to her father. Ernest had been her favourite, but she liked Harry too. Her father was becoming old lately, she noticed. He would miss her. Sometimes he could be very nice. Not long before, when she had been laid up for a day, he had read her out a ghost story and made toast for her at the fire. Another day, when their mother was alive, they had all gone for a picnic to the Hill of Hoth. She remembered her father putting on her mother's bonnet to make the children laugh. Her time was running out, but she continued to sit by the window, leaning her head against the window curtain, inhaling the odour of dusty cretonne. Down far in the avenue she could hear a street organ playing. She knew the air. Strange that it should come that very night to remind her of the promise to her mother, her promise to keep the home together as long as she could. She remembered the last night of her mother's illness. She was again in the close, dark room at the other side of the hall, and outside she heard a melancholy air of Italy. The organ player had been ordered to go away and given sixpence. She remembered her father strutting back into the sick room, saying, 
damned Italians coming over here. As she mused, the pitiful vision of her mother's life laid its spell on the very quick of her being, that life of commonplace sacrifices closing in final craziness. She trembled as she heard again her mother's voice saying constantly with foolish insistence, Derevan Saran! Derevan Saran! She stood up in a sudden impulse of terror. Escape! She must escape! Frank would save her. He would give her life, perhaps love, too. But she wanted to live. Why should she be unhappy? She had a right to happiness. Frank would take her in his arms, fold her in his arms. He would save her. She stood among the swaying crowd in the station at the north wall. He held her hand, and she knew that he was speaking to her, saying something about the passage over and over again. The station was full of soldiers with brown baggages. Through the wide doors of the sheds she caught a glimpse of the black mass of the boat lying in beside the quay wall with illumined portholes. She answered nothing. She felt her cheek pale and cold, and, out of a maze of distress, she prayed to God to direct her, to show her what was her duty. The boat blew a long, mournful whistle into the mist. If she went, tomorrow she would be on the sea with Frank, steaming towards Buenos Aires. Their passage had been booked. Could she still draw back after all he had done for her? Her distress awoke a nausea in her body, and she kept moving her lips in silent, fervent prayer. A bell clanged upon her heart. She felt him seize her hand. Come! All the seas of the world tumbled about her heart. He was drawing her into them. He would drown her. She gripped with both hands at the iron railing. Come! No! 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 It was impossible! Her hands clutched the iron in frenzy. Amid the seas she sent a cry of anguish. Evelyn! Evie! He rushed beyond the barrier and called to her to follow. He was shouted at to go on, but he still called to her. She set her white face to him, passive, like a helpless animal. Her eyes gave him no sign of love, or farewell, or recognition. End of Evelyn by James Joyce Life by Ben Heck This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Life by Ben Hecht from the Little Review. The sun was shining in the dirty street. Old women with shapeless bodies waddled along on their way to market. Bearded old men who looked like the fathers of Jerusalem walked flat-footed, nodding back and forth. The tread of the processional surviving in Halstead Street thought Moyes, the young dramatist, who was moving with the crowd. Children sprawled in the refuse-laden alleys. One of them ragged and clotted with dirt, stood half-dressed on the curbing, and urinated into the street. Wagons rumbled, filled with fruits and iron and rags and vegetables. Human voices babbled above the noises of the traffic. Moyes watched the lively scene. Every day it's the same, he thought, the same smells, the same noise and people swarming over the pavements. I am the only one in the street whose soul is awake. There's a pretty girl looking at me. She suspects the condition of my soul. Her fingers are dirty. Why doesn't she buy different shoes? She thinks I am lost. In five years she will be fat. In ten years she will waddle with a shawl over her head. The young dramatist smiled. Good God, he thought, where do they come from? Where are they going? No place to no place. 
but always moving, shuffling, waddling, crying out. The sun shines on them. The rain pours on them. It burns. It freezes. Today they are bright with color. Tomorrow they are gray with gloom. But they are always the same, always in motion. The young dramatist stopped on the corner and looked around him spied a figure sitting on the sidewalk, leaning against the wall of a building. The figure was an old man. He had a long white beard. He had his legs tucked under him, and an upturned tattered hat rested in his lap. His thin face was raised and the sun beat down on it, but his eyes were closed. Asleep, mused Moise. He moved closer to him. The man's head was covered with long silky white hair that hung down to his neck and hid his ears. He was uncombed. His face in the sun looked like the face of an ascetic thin, finely veined. He had a long nose and almost colorless lips, and the skin on his cheeks was white. It was drawn tight over his bones, leaving few wrinkles. An expression of peace rested over him, peace and detachment. Of the noise and babble he heard nothing. His eyes were closed to the crowded frantic street. He sat, his head back, his face bathed in the sun, smileless and dreaming. A beggar, thought Moise, asleep, oblivious, dead. All day he sits in the sun like a saint, immobile, like one of the old Alexandrian ascetics, like a delicately carved image. He is awake in himself, but dead to others. The waves cannot touch him. His thoughts, oh, to know his thoughts and his dreams. Suddenly the eyes of the young dramatist widened. He was looking at the beggar's long hair that hung to his neck. It's moving, he whispered half aloud. He came closer and stood over the old man and gazed intently at the top of his head. The hair was swaying faintly, each separate fiber moving alone. It shifted, rose imperceptibly, and fell. It quivered and glided. Lice, murmured Moise. He watched. Silent and asleep, the old man sat, with his thin face to the sun, and his hair moved. Vermin swarmed through it, creeping, crawling, tiny, and infinitesimal. Every strand was palpitating, shuddering under their mysterious energy. At first Moise could hardly make them out, but his eyes gradually grew accustomed to the sight, and as he watched he saw the hair swell like waves riding over the water, saw it drop and flutter, coil and uncoil of its own accord. Vermin raised it up, pulled it out, streaming up and down tirelessly in vast armies. They crawled furiously like dust specks, blown thick through the white beard. They streamed and shifted and were never still. They moved in and out, from no place to no place, but always moving, frantic and frenzied. An old woman passed, and with a shake of her head, dropped two pennies into the upturned hat. Moise hardly saw her. He saw only the palpitating swarms that were now facing, easily visible through the grey-white hair. Some ventured down over the white ascetic face, crawling in every direction, travelling around the lips and over the closed eyes, emerging suddenly in thick streams from behind the covered ears and losing themselves under the ever-moving beard. And Moise, his senses strained, thought he heard a noise, 
a faint crunching noise. He listened. The noise seemed to grow louder. He began to itch, but he remained bending over the head. He could hear them, like a faraway murmur, a purring, uncertain sound. Their shouting and groaning, crying out, weeping and laughing, he mused. It is life, life. He looked up and down the crowded burning street with its frantic crowd and smiled. Life, he repeated. He walked away. Before him floated the hair of the beggar moving as if stirred by a slow wind, and he itched. But who was the old man, he thought. A young woman, plump and smiling, jostled him. He felt her soft hip pressing against him for a moment. A child running barefoot through the street brushed against his legs. He felt its sticky fingers seize him for an instant, and then the child was gone. On he walked. Three young men confronted him for a second time. He passed between two of them, squeezed by their shoulders. A shapeless old woman bumped him with her back as she shuffled past. Two children dodged in and out, screaming, and seized his arm to turn on. The young dramatist stopped and remained standing still, looking about him. Then he laughed. Life, he murmured again, and, I am the old man, he added, I, I. End of story. Pleasure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Clarica. Measure for Measure by Edith Nesbitt. More centuries ago than I care to say, the people of Vienna were governed too mildly. The reason was that the reigning Duke Vicentio was excessively good-natured and disliked to see offenders made unhappy. The consequence was that the number of ill-behaved persons in Vienna was enough to make the Duke shake his head in sorrow when his chief secretary showed him it at the end of a list. He decided, therefore, that wrongdoers must be punished, but popularity was dear to him. He knew that, if he were suddenly strict after being lax, he would cause people to call him a tyrant. For this reason he told his privy council that he must go to Poland on important business of state. I have chosen Angelo to rule in my absence, said he. Now this Angelo, although he appeared to be noble, was really a mean man. He had promised to marry a girl called Mariana, and now would have nothing to say to her, because her dowry had been lost. So poor Mariana lived forlornly, waiting every day for the footstep of her stingy lover, and loving him still. Having appointed Angelo his deputy, the duke went to a friar called Thomas, and asked him for a friar's dress and instruction in the art of giving religious counsel, for he did not intend to go to Poland but to stay at home and see how Angelo governed. Angelo had not been a day in office when he condemned to death a young man named Claudio for an act of rash selfishness which nowadays would only be punished by severe reproof. Claudio had a queer friend called Lucio, and Lucio saw a chance of freedom for Claudio if Claudio's beautiful sister Isabella would plead with Angelo. Isabella was at that time living in a nunnery. Nobody had won her heart, and she thought that she would like to become a sister or nun. Meanwhile Claudio did not lack an advocate. An ancient lord, Aeschylus, was for leniency. Let us cut a little, but not kill, he said. This gentleman had a most noble father. Angelo was unmoved. If twelve men find me guilty, I ask no more mercy than is in the law. Angelo then ordered the provost to see that Claudio was executed at nine the next morning. 
After the issue of this order, Angelo was told that the sister of the condemned man desired to see him. "'Admit her,' said Angelo. On entering with Lucio, the beautiful girl said, "'I am a woeful suitor to your honor." "'Well,' said Angelo. She colored at his chill monosyllable, and the ascending red increased the beauty of her face. "'I have a brother who is condemned to die,' she continued. "'Condemn the fault, I pray you, and spare my brother.' Every fault, said Angelo, is condemned before it is committed. A fault cannot suffer. Justice would be void if the committer of the fault went free. She would have left the court if Lucio had not whispered to her, You are too cold. You could not speak more tamely if you wanted a pin. So Isabella attacked Angelo again, and when he said, I will not pardon him, she was not discouraged and when he said, he's sentenced, tis too late, she returned to the assault. But all her fighting was with reasons, and with reasons she could not prevail over the deputy. She told him that nothing becomes power like mercy. She told him that humanity receives and requires mercy from heaven, that it was good to have gigantic strength, and had to use it like a giant. She told him that lightning rives the oak and spares the myrtle. She bade him look for fault in his own breast, and if he found one, to refrain from making it an argument against her brother's life. Angelo found a fault in his breast at that moment. He loved Isabella's beauty, and was tempted to do for her beauty what he would not do for the love of man. He appeared to relent, for he said, Come to me tomorrow before noon. She had, at any rate, succeeded in prolonging her brother's life for a few hours. In her absence, Angelo's conscience rebuked him for trifling with his judicial duty. When Isabella called on him the second time, he said, Your brother cannot live. Isabella was painfully astonished, but all she said was, Even so, heaven keep your honor. But as she turned to go, Angelo felt that his duty and honor were slight in comparison with the loss of her. "'Give me your love,' he said, "'and Claudio shall be freed. "'Before I would marry you, "'he should die if he had twenty heads to lay upon the block,' said Isabella, "'for she saw then that he was not the just man he pretended to be. "'So she went to her brother in prison "'to inform him that he must die.' At first he was boastful, and promised to hug the darkness of death. But when he clearly understood that his sister could buy his life by marrying Angelo, he felt his life more valuable than her happiness, and he exclaimed, "'Sweet sister, let me live!' "'O oh, faithless coward! O oh, dishonest wretch!' she cried. At this moment the duke came forward, in the habit of a friar, to request some speech with Isabella. He called himself Friar Ludowick. The duke then told her that Angelo was affianced to Maria, whose love story he related. He then asked her to consider this plan. Let Mariana, in the dress of Isabella, go closely veiled to Angelo, and say, in a voice resembling Isabella's, that if Claudio were spared she would marry him. Let her take the ring from Angelo's little finger, that it might be afterwards proved that his visitor was Mariana. Isabella had, of course, a great respect for friars, who are as nearly like nuns as men can be. She agreed, therefore, to the duke's plan. They were to meet again at the moated grange, Mariana's house. In the street the duke saw Lucio, who, seeing a man dressed like a friar, called out, "'What news of the duke, friar?' I have none, said the duke. Lucio then told the duke some stories about Angelo. Then he told one about the duke. The duke contradicted him. Lucio was provoked, and called the duke a shallow, ignorant fool, though he pretended to love him. The duke shall know you better if I live to report you, said the duke, grimly. Then he asked Escalus, whom he saw in the street, what he thought of his ducal master. Aeschylus, who imagined he was speaking to a friar, replied, The duke is a very temperate gentleman, 
who prefers to see another Mary to being Mary himself. The Duke then proceeded to call on Mariana. Isabella arrived immediately afterwards, and the Duke introduced the two girls to one another, both of whom thought he was a friar. They went into a chamber apart from him to discuss the saving of Claudio, and while they talked in low and earnest tones, the Duke looked out of the window and saw the broken sheds and flower-beds, black with moss, which betrayed Mariana's indifference to her country dwelling. Some woman would have beautified their garden, not she. She was for the town. She neglected the joys of the country. He was sure that Angelo would not make her unhappier. "'We are agreed, father,' said Isabella, as she returned with Mariana. So Angelo was deceived by the girl whom he had dismissed from his love, and put on her finger a ring he wore, in which was set a milky stone, which flashed in the light with secret colors. Hearing of her success, the duke went next day to the prison prepared to learn that an order had arrived for Claudio's release. It had not, however, but a letter was handed to the provost while he waited. His amazement was great when the provost read aloud these words. Whatsoever you may hear to the contrary, let Claudio be executed by four of the clock. Let me have his head sent me by five. But the duke said to the provost, You must show the deputy another head, and he held out a letter and a signet. Here, he said, are the hand and seal of the duke. He is to return, I tell you, and Angelo knows it not. Give Angelo another head. The provost thought, This friar speaks with power. I know the duke's signet, and I know his hand. He said, at length, A man died in the prison this morning, a pirate the age of Claudio, with a beard of his color. I will show his head. The pirate's head was duly shown to Angelo, who was deceived by its resemblance to Claudio's. The duke's return was so popular that the citizens removed the city gates from their hinges to assist his entry into Vienna. Angelo and Aeschylus duly presented themselves, and were profusely praised for their conduct of affairs in the duke's absence. It was, therefore, the more unpleasant for Angelo when Isabella, passionately angered by his treachery, knelt before the duke and cried for justice. When her story was told, the duke cried, To prison with her for a slanderer of our right hand. But stay, who persuaded you to come here? Friar Lodowick, she said. Who knows him? inquired the duke. I do, my lord, replied Lucio. I beat him because he spake against your grace. A friar called Peter here said, Friar Lodowick is a holy man. Isabella was removed by an officer, and Mariana came forward. She took off her veil and said to Angelo, This is the face you once swore was worth looking on. Bravely he faced her as she put out her hand and said, This is the hand which wears the ring you thought to give another. I know the woman, said Angelo. Once there was talk of marriage between us, but I found her frivolous. Mariana here burst out that they were affianced by the strongest vows. Angelo replied by asking the duke to insist on the production of Friar Lodowick. He shall appear, promised the duke, and bade Aeschylus examine the missing witness thoroughly while he was elsewhere. Presently the duke reappeared in the character of Friar Lodowick, and accompanied by Isabella and the provost. He was not so much examined as abused and threatened by Aeschylus. Lucio asked him to deny, if he cared, that he called the duke a fool and a coward, and had had his nose pulled for his impudence. "'To prison with him!' shouted Aeschylus. But as hands were laid upon him, the duke pulled off his friar's hood, and was a duke before them all. "'Now,' he said to Angelo, "'if you have any impudence that can yet serve you, Work it for all it's worth. Immediate sentence and death is all I beg, was the reply. Were you affianced to Mariana? asked the duke. I was, said Angelo. Then marry her instantly, said his master. Marry them, he said to Friar Peter, and return with them here. Come hither, Isabel, said the duke in tender tones. Your friar is now your prince. 
and grieves he was too late to save your brother. But well the roguish duke knew he had saved him. Oh, pardon me, she cried, that I employed a sovereign in my trouble. You are pardoned, he said gaily. At that moment Angelo and his wife re-entered. And now, Angelo, said the duke, gravely, we condemn thee to the block on which Claudio laid his head. O oh, my most gracious lord, called Mariana, mock me not. You shall buy a better husband, said the duke. O oh, my dear lord, said she, I crave no better man. Isabella nobly added her prayer to Mariana's, but the duke feigned inflexibility. Provost, he said, how came it that Claudio was executed at an unusual hour? Afraid to confess the lie he had imposed upon Angelo, the provost said, I had a private message. You are discharged from your office, said the duke. The provost then departed. Angelo said, I am sorry to have caused so much sorrow. I prefer death to mercy. Soon there was a motion in the crowd. The provost reappeared with Claudio. Like a big child, the provost said, I saved this man. He is like Claudio. The duke was amused, and said to Isabella, Pardon him, because he is like your brother. He is like my brother, too, if you, dear Isabel, will be mine. She was his with a smile, and the duke forgave Angelo, and promoted the provost. Lucio he condemned to marry a stout woman with a bitter tongue. End of Measure for Measure by Edith Nesbitt My Own True Ghost Story by Rudyard Kipling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, the city of dreadful night. Somewhere in the other world, where there are books and pictures and plays and shop windows to look at, and thousands of men who spend their lives in building up all four, lives a gentleman who writes real stories about the real insides of people, and his name is Mr. Walter Bassant. But he will insist upon treating his ghosts, he has published half a workshop full of them, with levity. He makes his ghost seers talk familiarly, and in some cases flirt outrageously with the phantoms. You may treat anything from a viceroy to a vernacular paper with levity, but you must behave reverently toward a ghost, and particularly an Indian one. There are in this land ghosts who take the form of fat, cold, pobby corpses and hide in trees near the roadside till a traveller passes. Then they drop upon his neck and remain. There are also terrible ghosts of women who have died in childbed. These wander along the pathways at dusk or hide in the crops near a village and call seductively. But to answer their call is death in this world and the next. Their feet are turned backward that all sober men may recognize them. There are ghosts of little children who have been thrown into wells. These haunt well curbs and the fringes of jungles, and wail under the stars, or catch women by the wrist and beg to be taken up and carried. These and the corpse ghosts, however, are only vernacular articles, and do not attack sahibs. No native ghost has yet been authentically reported to have frightened an Englishman, but many English ghosts have scared the life out of both white and black. Nearly every other station owns a ghost. They are said to be two at Simla, not counting the woman who blows the bellows at Sairi Dak Bungalow on the old road. Musuri has a house haunted of a very lively thing. A white lady is supposed to do night watchmen round the house in Lahore. Dalhousie says that one of her houses repeats on autumn evenings all the incidents of a horrible horse and precipice accident. Muri has a merry ghost, and now that she has been swept by cholera, will have room for a sorrowful one. There are officers' quarters in Myanmar whose doors open without reason and whose furniture is guaranteed to creak, not with the heat of June, but with the weight of invisibles who come to lounge in the chairs. Peshawar possesses houses that none will willingly rent, and there is something, not fever, wrong with the big bungalow in Allahabad. 
the older provinces simply bristle with haunted houses and march phantom armies along their main thoroughfares. Some of the dark bungalows on the Grand Trunk Road have handy little cemeteries in their compound, witnesses to the changes and chances of this mortal life in the days when men drove from Calcutta to the northwest. These bungalows are objectionable places to put up in. They are generally very old, always dirty, while the consumer is as ancient as the bungalow. He either chatters senilely or falls into the long trances of age. In both moods he is useless. If you get angry with him he refers to some sahib dead and buried these thirty years and says that when he was in that sahib's service not a consumer in the province could touch him. Then he jabbers and moles and trembles and fidgets among the dishes and you repent your irritation. In these dark bungalows ghosts are most likely to be found, and when found they should be made note of. Not long ago it was my business to live in dark bungalows. I never inhabited the same house for three nights running, and grew to be learned in the breed. I lived in government-built ones with red brick walls and rail ceilings, an inventory of the furniture posted in every room, and an excited snake at the threshold to give welcome. I lived in converted ones, old houses officiating as dark bungalows, where nothing was in its proper place and there wasn't even a fowl for dinner. I lived in second-hand palaces where the wind blew through open-work marble traceries just as uncomfortably as through a broken pane. I lived in dark bungalows where the last entry in the visitor's book was fifteen months old and where they slashed off the curry kid's head with a sword. It was my good luck to meet all sorts of men from sober traveling missionaries and deserters flying from British regiments, to drunken loafers who threw whiskey bottles at all who passed, and my still greater good fortune just to escape a maternity case. Seeing that a fair proportion of the tragedy of our lives out here acted itself in dark bungalows, I wondered that I had met no ghosts. A ghost that would voluntarily hang about a dark bungalow would be mad, of course, but so many men have died mad in dark bungalows that there must be a fair percentage of lunatic ghosts. In due time I found my ghost, or ghosts rather, for there were two of them. Up till that hour I had sympathized with Mr. Besant's method of handling them as shown in the strange case of Mr. Lucraft and other stories. I am now in opposition. We will call the bungalow Katmal Dock Bungalow, but that was the smallest part of the horror. A man with a sensitive hide has no right to sleep in dark bungalows. He should marry. Cottonwall dark bungalow was old and rotten and unrepaired. The floor was worn brick, the walls were filthy, and the windows were nearly black with grime. It stood on a bypath largely used by native sub-deputy assistants of all kinds, from finance to forests, but real sahibs were rare. The consumer who was nearly bent double with old age said so. When I arrived there was a fitful, undecided rain on the face of the land, accompanied by a restless wind, and every gust made a noise like the rattling of dry bones in the stiff toddy palms outside. The consumer completely lost his head on my arrival. He had served a sahib once. Did I know that sahib? He gave me the name of a well-known man who had been buried for more than a quarter of a century, and showed me an ancient daguerreotype of that man in his prehistoric youth. I had seen a steel engraving of him at the head of a double volume of memoirs a month before, and I felt ancient beyond telling. The day shut in and the consumer went to get me food. He did not go through the pretense of calling it Kana, man's victuals. He said Ratab, and that means, among other things, grub, dog's rations. There was no insult in his choice of the term. He had forgotten the other word, I suppose. While he was cutting up the dead bodies of animals, I settled myself down after exploring the dark bungalow. There were three rooms beside my own, which was a corner kennel, each giving into the other through dingy white doors fastened with long iron bars. The bungalow was a very solid one, but the partition walls of the rooms were almost jerry-built in their flimsiness. Every step or bang of a trunk echoed from my room down the other three, and every footfall came back tremulously from the far walls. For this reason I shut the door. There were no lamps, only candles and long glass shades. An oil wick was set in the bathroom. For bleak, unadulterated misery, that dark bungalow was the worst of the many that I had ever set foot in. There was no fireplace, and the windows would not open, so a brazier of charcoal would have been useless. 
The rain and the wind splashed and gurgled and moaned round the house, and the toddy palms rattled and roared. Half a dozen jackals went through the compound singing, and a hyena stood afar off and mocked them. A hyena would convince a Sadducee of the resurrection of the dead, the worst sort of dead. Then came the ratab, a curious male, half native and half English in composition, with the old consumer babbling behind my chair about dead and gone English people, and the wind-blown candles playing shadow bow peep with the bed and the mosquito curtains. It was just the sort of dinner and evening to make a man think of every single one of his past sins, and of all the others that he intended to commit if he lived. Sleep, for several hundred reasons, was not easy. The lamp in the bathroom threw the most absurd shadows into the room, and the wind was beginning to talk nonsense. Just when the reasons were drowsy with blood-sucking, I heard the regular, let us take and heave him over grunt of dooley bears in the compound. First one dooley came in, then a second, and then a third. I heard the dooleys dumped on the ground, and the shutter in front of my door shook. That's someone trying to come in, I said, but no one spoke, and I persuaded myself that it was the gusty wind. The shutter of the room next to mine was attacked, flung back, and the inner door opened. That's some sub-deputy assistant, I said, and he has brought his friends with him. Now they'll talk and spit and smoke for an hour. But there were no voices and no footsteps. No one was putting his luggage into the next room. The door shut, and I thanked Providence that I was to be left in peace. But I was curious to know where the Dooleys had gone. I got out of bed and looked into the darkness. There was never a sign of a Dooley. Just as I was getting into bed again, I heard in the next room the sound that no man in his senses can possibly mistake. The whir of a billiard ball down the length of the slates when the striker is stringing for break. No other sound is like it. A minute afterwards there was another whir, and I got into bed. I was not frightened. Indeed I was not. I was very curious to know what had become of the Dooleys. I jumped into bed for that reason. Next minute I heard the double click of a cannon and my hair sat up. It is a mistake to say that hair stands up. The skin of the head tightens and you can feel a faint prickly bristling all over the scalp. That is the hair sitting up. There was a whir and a click, and both sounds could only have been made by one thing, a billiard ball. I argued the matter out at great length with myself, and the more I argued, the less probable it seemed that one bed, one table, and two chairs, all the furniture of the room next to mine, could so exactly duplicate the sounds of a game of billiards. After another cannon, a three-cushion one to judge by the whir, I argued no more. I had found my ghost and would have given worlds to have escaped from that dark bungalow. I listened, and with each listen the game grew clearer. There was wear on wear and click on click. Sometimes there was a double click and a wear and another click. Beyond any sort of doubt people were playing billiards in the next room, and the next room was not big enough to hold a billiard table. Between the pauses of the wind I heard the game go forward, stroke after stroke. I tried to believe that I could not hear voices, but that attempt was a failure. Do you know what fear is? Not ordinary fear of insult, injury, or death, but abject, quivering dread of something that you cannot see. Fear that draws the inside of the mouth and half of the throat. Fear that makes you sweat on the palms of the hands and gulp in order to keep the uvula at work. This is a fine fear a great cowardice, and must be felt to be appreciated. The very improbability of billiards in a dark bungalow proved the reality of the thing. No man, drunk or sober, can imagine a game at billiards or invent the spitting crack of a screw cannon. A severe course of dark bungalows has this disadvantage. It breeds infinite credulity. If a man's said to be a confirmed dark bungalow haunter, there is a corpse in the next room, and there's a mad girl in the next but one, and the woman and man on that camel have just eloped from a place sixty miles away, the hero would not disbelieve, because he would know that nothing is too wild, grotesque, or horrible to happen in a dark bungalow. This credulity unfortunately extends to ghosts. A rational person fresh from his own house would have turned on his side and slept. I did not. So surely, as I was given up as a bad carcass by the scores of things in the bed 
because the bulk of my blood was in my heart, so surely did I hear every stroke of a long game at billiards played in the echoing room behind the iron-barred door. My dominant fear was that the players might want a marker. It was an absurd fear, because creatures who could play in the dark would be above such superfluities. I only know that that was my terror, and it was real. After a long, long while, the game stopped and the door banged. I slept because I was dead tired. Otherwise, I should have preferred to have kept awake. Not for everything in Asia would I have dropped the door bar and peered into the dark of the next room. When the morning came, I considered that I had done well and wisely and inquired for the means of departure. By the way, Kansuma, I said, what were those three doolies doing in my compound in the night? There were no doolies, said the Kansuma. I went into the next room, and the daylight streamed through the open door. I was immensely brave. I would, at that hour, have played black pool with the owner of the big black pool down below. Has this place always been a dark bungalow? I asked. No, said the Kansuma. Ten or twenty years ago. I have forgotten how long. It was a billiard room. A how much? A billiard room for the sahibs who built the railway. I was Kansuma then in the big house where all the railway sahibs lived, and I used to come across with brandy shrub. These three rooms were all one, and they held a big table on which the sahibs played every evening. But the sahibs are all dead now, and the railway runs, you say, nearly to Kabul. Do you remember anything about the sahibs? It is long ago, but I remember that one sahib, a fat man and always angry, was playing here one night, and he said to me, Mongol gun, brandy panido, and I feel the glass, and he bent over the table to strike, and his head fell lower and lower till it hit the table, and his spectacles came off. And when we, the Saibs, and I myself ran to lift him, he was dead. I helped to carry him out. Ah, he was a strong Saib, but he is dead. And I, old Mongol Khan, am still living by your favor. That was more than enough. I had my ghost, a first-hand authenticated article. I would write the Society for Physical Research. I would paralyze the Empire with the news. But I would first of all put eighty miles of assessed cropland between myself and that duck bungalow before nightfall. The society might send their regular agent to investigate later on. I went into my room and prepared to park after noting down the fox of the case. As I smoked, I heard the game begin again, with a missing bulk this time for the wear was a short one. The door was open, and I could see into the room. Click, click, that was a cannon. I entered the room without fear for there was sunlight within and a fresh breeze without. The unseen game was going on at a tremendous rate, and well it might, when a restless little rat was running to and fro inside the dingy ceiling cloth, and a piece of loose window sash was making fifty breaks off the window bolt as it shook in the breeze. Impossible to mistake the sound of billiard balls! Impossible to mistake the wear of a ball over the slate! But I was to be excused, even when I shut my enlightened eyes, the sound was marvelously like that of a fast game. Entered angrily the faithful partner of my sorrows, Kadir Baksh. This bungalow is very bad and low caste. No wonder the presence is disturbed and is speckled. Three sets of dooley batters came to the bungalow late last night when I was sleeping outside and said that it was their custom to rest in the room set apart for the English people. What honor has the Kansama? They try to enter, but I tell them to go. No wonder if these Arias had been here, that the presence is sorely spotted. It is shame, and the work of a dirty man. Kadir Baksh did not say that he had taken from each gang two honors for rent in advance, and then, beyond my earshot, had beaten them with a big green umbrella whose use I could never before divine. But Kadir Baksh has no notions of morality. There was an interview with the consumer, but as he promptly lost his head, wrath gave place to pity and pity led to a long conversation, in the course of which he put the fat engineer sahib's tragic death in three separate stations, two of them fifty miles away. The third shift was to Calcutta, 
and there the sahib died while driving a dog cart. If I had encouraged him, the consumer would have wandered all through Bengal with his corpse. I did not go away as soon as I intended. I stayed for the night while the wind and the rat and the sash and the window bolt played a ding-dong hundred and fifty up. Then the wind ran out and the billiard stopped, and I felt that I had ruined my one genuine hallmarked ghost story. Had I only stopped at the proper time, I, I could have made anything out of it. That was the bitterest thought of all. End of My Own True Ghost Story by Rudyard Kipling From The Happy Prince and Other Stories by Oscar Wilde This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Nightingale and the Rose She said that she would dance with me if I brought her red roses, cried the young student. But in all my garden there is no red rose. From her nest in a home oak tree, the nightingale heard him, and she looked out through the leaves and wondered. No red rose in all my garden, he cried, and his beautiful eyes filled with tears. Ah, on what little things does happiness depend? I have read all that the wise men have written, and all the secrets of philosophy are mine, yet for want of a red rose is my life made wretched. Here at last is a true lover, said the nightingale. Night after night have I sung of him, though I knew him not. Night after night have I told his story to the stars, and now I see him. His hair is dark as the hyacinth blossom, and his lips are red as the rose of his desire, but passion has made his face like pale ivory, and sorrow has set her seal upon his brow. The prince gives a ball tomorrow night, murmured the young student, and my love will be of the company. If I bring her a red rose, she will dance with me till dawn. If I bring her a red rose, I shall hold her in my arms, and she will lean her head upon my shoulder, and her hand will be clasped in mine. But there is no red rose in my garden, so I shall sit lonely, and she will pass me by. She will have no heed of me, and my heart will break. Here indeed is the true lover, said the nightingale. What I sing of, he suffers. What is joy to me, to him is pain. Surely love is a wonderful thing. It is more precious than emeralds, and dearer than fine opals. Pearls and pomegranates cannot buy it, nor is it set forth in the marketplace. It may not be purchased of the merchants, nor can it be weighed out in the balance for gold. The musicians will sit in their gallery, said the young student, and play upon their stringed instruments, and my love will dance to the sound of the harp and the violin. She will dance so lightly that her feet will not touch the floor, and the courtiers in their gay dresses will throng round her. But with me she will not dance, for I have no red rose to give her. And he flung himself down on the grass, and buried his face in his hands, and wept. Why is he weeping? asked the little green lizard, as he ran past him with his tail in the air. Why, indeed? said a butterfly who was fluttering about after a sunbeam. "'Why, indeed,' whispered a daisy to his neighbour in a soft, low voice. "'He is weeping for a red rose,' said the nightingale. "'For a red rose,' they cried. "'How very ridiculous!' And the little lizard, who was something of a cynic, laughed outright. But the nightingale understood the secret of the student's sorrow and she sat silent in the oak tree, and thought about the mystery of love. Suddenly she spread her brown wings for flight, and soared into the air. She passed through the grove like a shadow, and like a shadow she sailed across the garden. In the center of the grass plot was standing a beautiful rose tree, and when she saw it she flew over to it and licked upon a spray. Give me a red rose, she cried and I will sing you my sweetest song. But the tree shook its head. My roses are white, it answered, as white as the foam of the sea, and whiter than the snow upon the mountain. 
but go to my brother who grows round the old sundial, and perhaps he will give you what you want. So the nightingale flew over to the rose tree that was growing round the old sundial. Give me a red rose, she cried, and I will sing you my sweetest song. But the tree shook its head. My roses are yellow, it answered. As yellow as the hair of the mermaiden who sits upon an amber throne, and yellower than the daffodil that blooms in the meadow before the mower comes with his scythe. But go to my brother who grows beneath the student's window, and perhaps he will give you what you want. So the nightingale flew over to the rose tree that was growing beneath the student's window. Give me a red rose, she cried, and I will sing you my sweetest song. But the tree shook its head. My roses are red, it answered, as red as the feet of the dove, and redder than the great fans of coral that wave and wave in the ocean cavern. But the winter has chilled my veins, and the frost has nipped my buds, and the storm has broken my branches, and I shall have no roses at all this year. One red rose is all I want, cried the nightingale. Only one red rose. Is there no way by which I can get it? There is a way, answered the tree, but it is so terrible that I dare not tell it to you. Tell it to me, said the nightingale. I am not afraid. If you want a red rose, said the tree, you must build it out of music by moonlight, and stain it with your own heart's blood. You must sing to me with your breast against a thorn, all night long you must sing to me, and the thorn must pierce your heart, and your life-blood must flow into my veins and become mine. Death is a great price to pay for a red rose, cried the nightingale and life is very dear to all. It is pleasant to sit in the green wood, and to watch the sun in his chariot of gold, and the moon in her chariot of pearl. Sweet is the scent of the hawthorn, and sweet are the bluebells that hide in the valley, and the heather that blows on the hill. Yet love is better than life, and what is the heart of a bird compared to the heart of a man? So she spread her brown wings for flight, and soared into the air. She swept over the garden like a shadow, and like a shadow she sailed through the grove. The young student was still lying on the grass where she had left him, and the tears were not yet dry in his beautiful eyes. Be happy, cried the nightingale. Be happy, you shall have your red rose. I will build it out of music by moonlight and stain it with my own heart's blood. All that I ask of you in return is that you will be a true lover, for love is wiser than philosophy, though she is wise, and mightier than power, though he is mighty. Flame-colored are his wings, and colored like flame is his body. His lips are sweet as honey, and his breath is like frankincense. The student looked up from the grass and listened, but he could not understand what the nightingale was saying to him, for he only knew the things that are written down in books. But the oak tree understood and felt sad, for he was very fond of the little nightingale who had built her nest in his branches. Sing me one last song, he whispered. I shall feel very lonely when you are gone. So the nightingale sang to the oak tree and her voice was like water bubbling from a silver jar. When she had finished her song, the student got up and pulled a notebook and a lead pencil out of his pocket. She has form, he said to himself as he walked away through the grove. That cannot be denied to her, but has she got feeling? I am afraid not. In fact, she is like most artists. She is all style without any sincerity. She would not sacrifice herself for others. She thinks merely of music, and everybody knows that the arts are selfish. 
Still, it must be admitted that she has some beautiful notes in her voice. What a pity it is that they do not mean anything, nor do any practical good. And he went into his room, and lay down on his little pallet bed, and began to think of his love, and after a time he fell asleep. And when the moon shone in the heavens, the nightingale flew to the rose tree, and set her breast against the thorn. All night long she sang with her breast against the thorn, and the cold crystal moon leaned down and listened. All night long she sang, and the thorn went deeper and deeper into her breast, and her life-blood ebbed away from her. She sang first of the birth of love in the heart of a boy and a girl, and on the topmost spray of the rose tree there blossomed a marvellous rose, petal following petal, as a song followed song. Pale was it at first, as the mist that hangs over the river, pale as the feet of the morning, and silver as the wings of the dawn. As the shadow of a rose in a mirror of silver, as the shadow of a rose in a water pool, so was the rose that blossomed on the topmost spray of the tree. But the tree cried to the nightingale to press closer against the thorn. Press closer, little nightingale, cried the tree, or the day will come before the rose is finished. So the nightingale pressed closer against the thorn, and louder and louder grew her song, for she sang of the birth of passion in the soul of a man and a maid. And a delicate flush of pink came into the leaves of the rose, like the flush in the face of the bridegroom when he kisses the lips of the bride. But the thorn had not yet reached her heart, so the rose's heart remained white, for only a nightingale's heart's blood can crimson the heart of a rose. And the tree cried to the nightingale to press closer against the thorn. Press closer, little nightingale, cried the tree, or the day will come before the rose is finished. So the nightingale pressed closer against the thorn, and the thorn touched her heart, and a fierce pang of pain shot through her. Bitter, bitter was the pain, and wilder and wilder grew her song, for she sang of the love that is perfected by death, of the love that dies not in the tomb. And the marvellous rose became crimson, like the rose of the eastern sky. Crimson was the girdle of petals, and crimson as a ruby was the heart. But the nightingale's voice grew fainter, and her little wings began to beat, and a film came over her eyes. Fainter and fainter grew her song, and she felt something choking her in her throat. Then she gave one last burst of music. The white moon heard it, and she forgot the dawn and lingered on in the sky. The red rose heard it, and it trembled all over with ecstasy, and opened its petals to the cold morning air. Echo bore it to her purple cavern in the hills, and woke the sleeping shepherds from their dreams. It floated through the reeds of the river, and they carried its message to the sea. Look, look, cried the tree, the rose is finished now. But the nightingale made no answer for she was lying dead in the long grass, with the thorn in her heart. And at noon the student opened his window and looked out. Why, what a wonderful piece of luck, he cried. Here is a red rose. I have never seen any rose like it in all my life. It is so beautiful that I am sure it has a long Latin name. And he leaned down and plucked it. Then he put on his hat, and ran up to the professor's house with the rose in his hand. The daughter of the professor was sitting in the doorway, winding blue silk on a reel, and her little dog was laying at her feet. "'You said that you would dance with me if I brought you a red rose,' cried the student. "'Here is the reddest rose in all the world. You will wear it tonight next to your heart, and as we dance together it will tell you how I love you.' But the girl frowned. 
"'I am afraid it will not go with my dress,' she answered. "'And besides, the Chamberlain's nephew has sent me some real jewels, "'and everybody knows that jewels cost far more than flowers.' "'Well, upon my word, you are very ungrateful,' said the student angrily, "'and he threw the rose into the street, where it fell into the gutter, "'and a cartwheel went over it.' "'Ungrateful,' said the girl. "'I tell you what, you are very rude. "'And after all, who are you? Only a student. "'Why, I don't believe you have even got silver buckles to your shoes "'as the Chamberlain's nephew has.' "'And she got up from her chair and went into the house. "'What a silly thing love is,' said the student as he walked away. "'It is not half as useful as logic, for it does not prove anything.' and it is always telling one of the things that are not going to happen, and making one believe things that are not true. In fact, it is quite unpractical, and, as in this age, to be practical is everything, I shall go back to philosophy and study metaphysics. So he returned to his room, and pulled out a great dusty book, and began to read. End of the Nightingale and the Rose. A Pair of Silk Stockings by Kate Chopin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Mrs. Somers, one day, found herself the unexpected possessor of fifteen dollars. It seemed to her a very large amount of money, and the way in which it stuffed and bulged her worn old portemonnaie gave her a feeling of importance such as she had not enjoyed for years. The question of investment was one that occupied her greatly. For a day or two she walked about, apparently in a dreamy state, but really absorbed in speculation and calculation. She did not wish to act hastily or to do anything she might afterward regret, but it was during the still hours of the night when she lay awake revolving plans in her mind that she seemed to see her way clearly toward a proper and judicious use of the money. A dollar or two should be added to the price usually paid for Janie's shoes, which would ensure their lasting an appreciable time longer than they usually did. She would buy so and so many yards of percale for the new shirt waists for the boys and Janie and Mag. She had intended to make the old ones do by skillful patching. Mag should have another gown. She had seen some beautiful patterns, veritable bargains in the shop windows and still there would be enough left for new stockings, two pairs apiece, and what darning that would save for a while. She would get caps for the boys and sailor hats for the girls. The vision of her little brood looking fresh and dainty and new for once in their lives excited her and made her restless and wakeful with anticipation. The neighbors sometimes talked of certain better days that little Mrs. Summers had known before she had ever thought of being Mrs. Summers. She herself indulged in no such morbid retrospection. She had no time, no second of time, to devote to the past. The deeds of the present absorbed her every faculty. A vision of the future, like some dim, gaunt monster, sometimes appalled her. But luckily, tomorrow never comes. Mrs. Summers was one who knew the value of bargains, who could stand for hours making her way inch by inch toward the desired object that was selling below cost. She could elbow her way if need be. She had learned to clutch a piece of goods and hold it and stick to it with persistence and determination till her turn came to be served, no matter when it came. But that day she was a little faint and tired. She had swallowed a light luncheon. No! Between getting the children fed and the place righted, and preparing herself for the shopping bout, she had actually forgotten to eat any luncheon at all. She sat herself upon a revolving stool before a counter that was comparatively deserted, trying to gather strength and courage to charge through an eager multitude that was besieging breastworks of shirting and figured lawn. 
An all-gone limp feeling had come over her, and she rested her hand aimlessly upon the counter. She wore no gloves. By degrees she grew aware that her hand had encountered something very soothing, very pleasant to touch. She looked down to see that her hand lay upon a pile of silk stockings. A placard nearby announced that they had been reduced in price from two dollars and fifty cents to one dollar and ninety-eight cents. And a young girl who stood behind the counter asked her if she wished to examine their line of silk hosiery. She smiled, just as if she had been asked to inspect a tiara of diamonds with the ultimate view of purchasing it. But she went on feeling the soft, sheeny, luxurious things with both hands now, holding them up to see them glisten and to feel them glide serpent-like through her fingers. Two hectic blotches came suddenly to her pale cheeks. She looked up at the girl. Do you think there are any eights and a half among these? There were any number of eights and a half. In fact, there were more of that size than any other. Here was a light blue pair. There were some lavender, some all black in various shades of tan and gray. Mrs. Summers selected a black pair and looked at them very long and closely. She pretended to be examining their texture, which the clerk assured her was excellent. A dollar and ninety-eight cents, she mused aloud. Well. I'll take this pair." She handed the girl a five-dollar bill and waited for her change and for her parcel. What a very small parcel it was. It seemed lost in the depths of her shabby old shopping bag. Mrs. Summers after that did not move in the direction of the bargain counter. She took the elevator, which carried her to an upper floor into the region of the ladies' waiting rooms. Here. In a retired corner, she exchanged her cotton stockings for the new silk ones which she had just bought. She was not going through any acute mental process or reasoning with herself, nor was she striving to explain to her satisfaction the motive of her action. She was not thinking at all. She seemed for the time to be taking a rest from that laborious and fatiguing function and to have abandoned herself to some mechanical impulse that directed her actions and freed her of responsibility. How good was the touch of the raw silk to her flesh! She felt like lying back in the cushioned chair and reveling for a while in the luxury of it. She did for a little while. Then she replaced her shoes, rolled the cotton stockings together, and thrust them into her bag. After doing this, she crossed straight over to the shoe department and took her seat to be fitted. She was fastidious. The clerk could not make her out. He could not reconcile her shoes with her stockings, and she was not too easily pleased. She held back her skirts and turned her feet one way and her head another way as she glanced down at the polished, pointed tipped boots. Her foot and ankle looked very pretty. She could not realize that they belonged to her and were a part of herself. She wanted an excellent and stylish fit, she told the young fellow who served her, and she did not mind the difference of a dollar or two more in price so long as she got what she desired. It was a long time since Mrs. Summers had been fitted with gloves. On rare occasions, when she had bought a pair, they were always bargains, so cheap that it would have been preposterous and unreasonable to have expected them to be fitted to the hand. Now she rested her elbow on the cushion of the glove counter, and a pretty, pleasant young creature, delicate and deft of touch, drew a long-wristed kid over Mrs. Sommer's hand. She smoothed it down over the wrist and buttoned it neatly, and both lost themselves for a second or two in admiring contemplation of the little symmetrical gloved hand. But there were other places where money might be spent. There were books and magazines piled up in the window of a stall a few paces down the street. Mrs. Summers bought two high-priced magazines, such as she had been accustomed to read in the days when she had been accustomed to other pleasant things. She carried them without wrapping. As well as she could, she lifted her skirts at the crossings. Her stockings and boots and well-fitted gloves had worked marvels in her bearing. 
had given her a feeling of assurance, a sense of belonging to the well-dressed multitude. She was very hungry. Another time she would have stilled the cravings for food until reaching her own home, where she would have brewed herself a cup of tea and taken a snack of anything that was available. But the impulse that was guiding her would not suffer her to entertain such a thought. There was a restaurant at the corner. She had never entered its doors. From the outside she had sometimes caught glimpses of spotless damask and shining crystal and soft-stepping waiters serving people of fashion. When she entered, her appearance created no surprise, no consternation, as she had half feared it might. She seated herself at a small table, alone, and an attentive waiter at once approached her to take her order. She did not want a profusion. She craved a nice and tasty bite. A half dozen blue points, a plump chop with cress, and something sweet. A creme frappe, for instance a glass of Rhine wine, and after all, a small cup of black coffee. While waiting to be served, she removed her gloves very leisurely and laid them beside her. Then she picked up a magazine and glanced through it, cutting the pages with the blunt edge of her knife. It was all very agreeable. The damask was even more spotless than it had seemed through the window, and the crystal more sparkling. There were quiet ladies and gentlemen who did not notice her, lunching at the small tables like her own. A soft, pleasing strain of music could be heard, and a gentle breeze was blowing through the window. She tasted a bite, and she read a word or two, and she sipped the amber wine and wiggled her toes in the silk stockings. The price of it made no difference. She counted the money out to the waiter and left an extra coin on his tray, whereupon he bowed before her as before a princess of royal blood. There was still money in her purse, and her next temptation presented itself in the shape of a matinee poster. It was a little later when she entered the theater. The play had begun, and the house seemed to her to be packed. But there were vacant seats here and there, and into one of them she was ushered between brilliantly dressed women who had gone there to kill time and eat candy and display their gaudy attire. There were many others who were there solely for the play and acting. It is safe to say that there was no one present who bore quite the attitude which Mrs. Summers did to her surroundings. She gathered in the whole, stage and players and people in one wide impression and absorbed it and enjoyed it. She laughed at the comedy and wept, she and the gaudy woman next to her wept over the tragedy. And they talked a little together over it. And the gaudy woman wiped her eyes and sniffed on a tiny square of filmy perfumed lace and passed little Mrs. Summers her box of candy. The play was over, the music ceased, the crowd filed out. It was like a dream ended. People scattered in all directions. Mrs. Summers went to the corner and waited for the cable car. A man with keen eyes who sat opposite to her seemed to like the study of her small pale face. It puzzled him to decipher what he saw there. In truth, he saw nothing. Unless he were wizard enough to detect a poignant wish, a powerful longing that the cable car would never stop anywhere, but go on and on with her forever. End of A Pair of Silk Stockings by Kate Chopin Who's Dog? By Francis Greig. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Whose Dog? By Francis Greig. From the Forum. Hey, there, ladies. Here, move on, you. The tone was authoritative, and old John, the village drunkard, crouched away. 
I weren't doing nothing. He clutched feebly at the loose hanging rags that clothed him. Only wanted to see same's them. Guess this pier's big enough to hold us all. Hello, John. Have a drink. A grinning boy held a can of salt water toward him. The quick maudlin tears sprang to the old man's eyes. Little fellas, he muttered, little fellas, they oughtn't to act that way. Give him a new necktie. He's got to go to dinner with the lodge. A handful of dank seaweed writhed around the old man's neck. That's a turtle, that is, the boy went on. The need for imparting information justifying his lapse from ragging the drunkard. There, swimming round, it's tied to that stake. You ought to seen it at low tide, when it was on the beach. It weighs ninety pounds. I seen a turtle want, the drunkard quavered. It was bigger than that. And they tied it to a stake, and it swam round, and it swam round. His sodden brain clutched for something more to say, some marvel with which to hold the interest of the gathered boys. It was good to talk. If only they would let him talk to them. If only they would let him sit on the store porch and smoke and gossip. He wouldn't be the town disgrace. Well, go on. What did to do? Hey, you! The boys were interrupted by the authority voice. I told you to move on, didn't I? Now, if I tell you again, I'll run you in, do ye hear? What you boys let that old bum hang around for you anyway? What's he doing here? Oh, he's fun. He weren't doing nothing. He was just a watching it swim. It's tied to that post. It don't come up no more. Watching it swim, eh, was he? Ah, oh, right. Whose dog is it? The officer turned and sauntered away. Sudden horror seized the old man. The liquor seemed drained out of his veins. His brain worked almost quickly. Whose dog? Whose dog? Say, he darted after the retreating boys. Say, that ain't no dog, is it? No dog. Tied up like that, to drown, say. Oh, keep off, I told you once. It's a turtle for the lodge dinner. The boy shook himself free. The old man stood a moment shaken. His pulpy brain worked dimly toward the conception of the pain that was consuming him. Whose dog? That man had asked, and he hadn't meant to help it. Whose dog? They could do it, tied up a dog to drown in sight of people like that. Cruel. He saw the policeman coming toward him again. In a sudden frenzy, he clutched his tattered garments about him and began to run, to run toward the end of the pier. The boys raced after him. What you got to do? They shouted. What you got to do? The old man turned and looked at them a moment with twitching features. I'm going to die, he said. Come on, you fellows, come on. The drunk's got to die. Come on, he's crying. There was a splash, a surge of green filth and mud spread and dyed the water. A row of expectant heads leaned over the rail. Say, he ain't come up. They waited. The policemen strolled leisurely down in response to their repeated cries. Who won't come up? What him, the drunk? The officer leaned lethargically over the rail. What am I going to do? Why, leave him. He ain't got no folks got to sit up nights waiting for him. Now you young ones go along home to your suppers, he indulgently commanded. And you little fellows, if you want crabs, be round here early. By tomorrow this place will be fairly swarming with them. End of story.